You're looking at a live feed of a Senate hearing room on Capitol Hill where the tech companies, Facebook, Twitter and Google, will soon testify before Congress. We expect them to say that content from Russian operatives reached far more users than the companies initially disclosed. This is the first of three hearings in just two days to dig into Russian propaganda and the 2016 campaign. We'll bring it to you live. Uh, in the meantime, we're here at the Washington Post to talk about uh, what to expect and why this hearing is so significant. I'm Libby Casey, and I'm here with Elizabeth Dwoskin, Silicon Valley correspondent. Thanks so much, Liza, uh, for talking about this. So important that you flew out from California uh, to be here. You reported last night in a story that I, I found pretty shocking, that, that Facebook says 126 million people, million users, uh, encountered this Russian propaganda. That's a huge number. It's, it's way more than what we'd heard originally. It's huge. It's about a th almost a third of the population of the United States. And it's much bigger than what the companies talked about before. So it's fascinating because I've been covering this now for nine months. And we start nine months ago, we have the company saying, oh, it's cr Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg saying, it's a crazy idea that fake news, this kind of exploitation of our platform could have influenced our election. Then, you know, fast forward eight months, they talk about how they found Russian ads, but they won't say who saw them. So we're pressing and pressing. And then they say, okay, 10 million people saw Russian ads. But it turns out that Russian content was all over Facebook, not just ads, just regular, ordinary Facebook posts, and which they hadn't said how many posts there were or how that added up. So just last night, the night before they're hauled in front of Congress to testify about this, they say, okay, actually, it was much bigger than 10 million. It was more than 10 times bigger the number of Americans. Have you seen these ads? I mean, the public has not seen them, even if members of the Senate and the House have. Yeah, some of them have dribbled out, and we're going to see some in the, you know, could be today, could be the next day, the, the ads are going to leak because Facebook gave them to Congress. You can't say the same for Twitter. So we'll, we'll see them. But yeah, we know the nature of some of them. We're not talking about ads that relate to Russia, right? I mean, nothing said, nothing screamed, I am Russian propaganda. No, it was completely the opposite. And if everyday Americans had been posting that stuff, you would have really not known it was Russian. There might have been some things that people have caught, like a weird misspelling or phrase that just looks like it didn't come from an American. Um, but in general, the, you know, these were pages where they took, they went on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest and YouTube, and we now know, and they basically, so it was all the platforms, and they basically took wedge issues in American society and figured out how to exploit division. So there was a page about succession from Texas, there, was, there were pages for Black Lives Matter, and Black Lives Matter were, activists were targeted, as we showed um, in, the last, in, the, in our reporting in the last month. There were pages for called Being Patriotic that were just general patriotism pages, but um, putting in very extreme messages to, on wedge issues. There was an LGBT page even, where they were seemed to be supporting LGBT issues and putting up pictures of gay people making cakes. And that was, though, stoking these divisions that were already in society. Let's go to Capitol Hill. Jordan Frazier is our reporter at Live, who's been monitoring how Congress is interpreting all of this. Jordan, three hearings over two days. Does it feel like the big focus right now? Yeah, busy couple of days, that's for sure. And your conversation that you were just having is so interesting because I think the weight of what you were just discussing is really sinking in on Capitol Hill here. Uh, I was speaking to Diane Feinstein just this morning and she herself told me that she was shocked to find out kind of the gravity and the impact that some of this misinformation has had um, in the days leading up to this hearing as they've been kind of preparing to pepper these tech companies with these questions. And in talking to members of the Intelligence Committee, the committee that will have these tech reps in front of them tomorrow, uh, they tell me that the, these hearings really come down to three things. And the first, right, is is these targeted advertisements because these are political ads that can be purchased for a little amount of money and really hyper-targeted to individuals, to communities, to interest groups. Um, and so Congress is really interested in the impact of those. The second is what you were just talking about, and it's this misinformation and how things kind of start to snowball. Something gets put out there, it's liked, it's shared, and then kind of takes on a life of its own. That's something Congress doesn't necessarily understand yet, and they're really hoping to nail that down over the course of these next couple of days. And then the last issue, Libby, quite frankly, is this issue of collusion. Uh, the tech companies have such vast data that they could really be the key to pin any sort of collusion activity between the Russian government and the campaigns, if there is any. And so Congress will definitely have that 
uh, question uh, to pose in their mind over the next couple of days. Um, and I will tell you one thing, you know, Congress hasn't been waiting for these hearings. They've already taken uh, action on the issue of the paid advertisements. Uh, Senator Klobuchar and Warner with the backing of Senator McCain, two Democrats and a Republican, as well as some uh, congressmen on the other side of uh, Capitol Hill here, they've introduced what they're calling the Honest Ads Act, which would basically apply the same rules that broadcast and print media have on political advertisements. Um, it would apply those same rules to digital advertising. And they think that's kind of the small, very small first step in combating these sort of issues. You know, it's so fascinating, Jordan, that uh, legislation, though, only has one Republican backer, John McCain, powerful. But, uh, but 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 solo so far in the Senate, and that's just looking at the ads. And as Jordan explained, treating them like broadcasters would be treated. But Liza, d does that get to the heart of, of, of a lot of this? Because we're talking about social media posts that were sort of cloaked in everyday interests, in everyday language that people were sharing. Right, so as we said, ads are just a fraction of the issue. The companies actually were focusing on ads and the members of Congress were focusing mm -hmm. on ads, but the reach and influence campaign was way bigger than advertising. The, the free post, the ordinary post, just you go, you set up a Facebook page and you start posting and people like you, those free posts had a much, much bigger reach. Than the, the, than the what Russians paid for to target Americans. So we see there the committee room where shortly a Senate Judiciary subcommittee that focuses on crime and terrorism will be gathering and they'll hear from the tech giants of Twitter, Facebook and Google. This is just the first of three hearings though. Jordan, why are different committees taking a bite of this? We, we really inspected the intelligence committees to be the ones to focus on this. Do they feel a little scooped because they're not hearing from the tech companies till tomorrow? Uh, you know, there's always a little bit of that here on Capitol Hill, of course. Uh, but I think the, in the members that I've spoken with, they really do see this as sort of an oversight role. You know, they don't, they can't bring prosecution necessarily to this, but they do feel this sort of responsibility to to ensure the the trustworthiness of our democratic process. And in talking to the members uh, here over the last couple of days, that's weighing very heavily on them. And, uh, you know, to a certain degree, and you were touching on this a moment ago, this is new territory for them. You know, Congress is very much reacting to a new reality. And so they're kind of playing the catch up game here a little bit. And, and that's why these hearings are so important in particular, because there's a lot to learn. There's a lot that Congress just doesn't know. I was talking to Senator Mark Warner this morning as well. Um, and as we all know, Virginia has a governor's race coming up just next week. Um, and there's this question, you know, if what happened in 2016, can it happen next week in November? Has it been going on? Uh, Senator Warner, you know, spoke to changes they've made in their, their polling process and kind of securing the polls themselves, but said, you know, this misinformation, that's still a threat. It's an ongoing threat. Um, you know, we're only getting answers to now, and so it might be too late for 20, uh, 2017 and the election next week, uh, but people are really hoping that the answers that come out of Congress and these hearings will be able to help men make sure this interference doesn't happen in 2018. Liza, the tech companies that we're hearing from are not sending the names and faces that we know. We're not seeing Sheryl Sandberg. We're not seeing Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook. We're seeing a general counsel, lawyer. Did that take some of the attention away from these hearings? I'm sure Silicon Valley is, is really tuned into what's going on. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think the specter of like the tobacco company executives being hauled before Washington, people, Americans remember that when tobacco, you know, when tobacco totally. companies testified and everybody watched. So certainly the last thing they would want is for Mark Zuckerberg or Google CEO Sundar Pichai to be forced to, to be pushed to testify. So it, what was interesting was clear, uh, you know, they, they seem to all be in agreement on this and probably coordinated it because I know they all announced that they were going to send their general counsels like within an hour of one another. They, they said that they were going to do that, which, you know, sometimes they, they do coordinate on these things. And I think what's been fascinating is to see actually them, these companies are rivals, but to see them try to come up with a strategy and where they work together, where they share data, because a lot of the, what the Russians were doing was exploiting the platforms across the board, and so it would help for them to share data because they would get clues into a bigger strategy. And they are, and it's, it's starting to happen more and more. So we're hearing from the general counsels of all three companies tomorrow. Today, we're, uh, instead of hearing from the general counsel, of uh, Google, we're hearing from someone who dealt with law enforcement and information security, who deals with that now. Um, 
are we expecting to get new information out of this? Because of your great reporting last night, we already got a preview of the fact that they're going to talk about how so many more people were reached through these uh, Russian propaganda campaigns. Are we expecting more news to drop? That's a good question. I think that there might be some tidbits, but I think they're just, I mean, clearly, they, you know, the reason that that information was leaked last night was to try to take attention away from the hearings today, and it, it, it worked. Um, but what we did see, and we shouldn't forget, is that each one of the companies in their own way disclosed last night, or the information came, was leaked, that the Russian influence was much bigger than any one of them said. For, for Google, Google had never even admitted that there was any Russian influence. Yesterday, they disclosed that there were 18 Russian YouTube channels um, that showed about 1,000 hours of video on YouTube. They say that very few people watched it. Um, and then we have Twitter. Twitter had made a big di disclosure. They had only found 201 Russian accounts. Last night, it was leaked that they found uh, 2,700 accounts, so from 200 to almost 3,000 Russian accounts. And then there were more than 30,000 bot accounts, so automated accounts that they associated with Russia that had something like 288 million impressions across Twitter. So the reach was much bigger. Um, you know, I'll be watching today to see if they, they slip in other details that are newsworthy. We'll bring that hearing to you as it gets started in just a few moments. Jordan, you know, so much focus right now on the Mueller investigation and the indictments and uh, mm -hmm. the plea deal that was announced yesterday. Uh, is this still of import on Capitol Hill? And is collusion part of the, uh, of the conversation that senators, especially Democrats, want to have today? Yeah, of course. I mean, this is this is an ongoing story. I think the indictments yesterday definitely kind of changed things. I think it put some things out of the reach of Congress now. Uh, but the questions are still there, and they will still hope to get those answers. Um, and like this, the hearings this week are important for that collusion aspect, because I think some here on Capitol Hill think the tech firms might hold some of the keys to show kind of timing of what happened with these Russian influences and what was happening during the campaigns. And that will be kind of uh, a parallel track that they'll be kind of wanting to plot out and see, see what that means. When you were talking about the platforms of Facebook and Twitter and Google, I think that's a really interesting question. And that is one of the keys that people will be talking about here on Capitol Hill, because what is Facebook? What is Twitter? Is it a publishing platform? Sheryl Sandberg says Facebook is a tech technology company. And so we're kind of in this weird new frontier that there is not necessarily a right answer, and that's what they're going to try to hammer out. Because how do you register or how do you regulate a tech company? You know, we've Congress and the United States government has regulated media companies because they have government licenses, but that's not the case in some of these tech companies. So it's kind of all of these new questions that they're going to be hammering out and uh, you know debating back and forth. Jordan, we're seeing some members of the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee gather in the hearing room. Among them. Uh, we saw Senator Al Franken. This subcommittee is chaired by Lindsey Graham, uh, so he'll be leading the proceedings, but we may see other members, of course, of this subcommittee as well as other members of judiciary come in. Lizza, you know, Jordan brought up a really important point that um, there may be keys to collusion or allegations of collusion that are held by these tech companies that really no one else can look into. They may know if there were indeed connections. Yeah, let, let me break that down for you. I think that there is a lot that they could know. For example, um, who were the people that liked Russian pages? And who were the people that liked pages associated with the Trump campaign? Were they the same people? Were the targeting strategies the same when you went and targeted people? Was there some sharing of not, not lists. We know they, they didn't share actual lists of Americans for targeted advertising because we reported that. But was there some sharing of who liked what on Facebook? And so then you might say, okay, um, you know, we're going to you know, pass over this list or this, these people who liked, and maybe they should be targeted too. So I think uh, one of the big questions is whether the committees can get that out. I think it's going to be much more likely to be Mueller because they have more powers. Jordan, uh, how politically divisive is this? Right. Uh, as all things on Capitol Hill, it all has this underbelly of politics. But I think there is sort of agreement, at least in broad strokes, that this is something that needs to be looked at. Uh, I think the solutions to it are where you get the disagreements, obviously. Um, but I want to pick up on one thing you were just mentioning. In this idea of liking and sharing and posting, you know, that's what we do every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so Congress is getting their head around how that actually works to influence an election as well.
Jordan Frazier, politics reporter on Capitol Hill, reporting for us live. Thank you so much, Jordan. You can see right there the representatives have taken their seats, and the committee is about to begin. Let's go to the hearing. Thank you all. Uh, the subcommittee will uh, come to order. Here's sort of the order of battle today. I'll make an opening statement. Senator Whitehouse, I think Senator Feinstein would like to make one, and I think if Senator Grassley comes, he will certainly be allowed to do so. The title of this hearing is Extremist Content and Russian Disinformation Online, Working with Tech to Find Solutions. That's exactly what we want to do, so uh, we're here to try to find solutions. Let me describe I think the challenge. I doubt if I would, would be here if it weren't for social media, to be honest with you, President Trump told Fox News on October the 20th, 2017. So this is the President of the United States saying that from his point of view, social media was an invaluable tool to help him win an election. I would, I would dare say that every politician up here today asking you questions uses your service and we find it invaluable to communicate with our constituents and get our message out. Not only do we use it, not only did the president use it, millions of Americans use your technology to share the first step of a grandchild, to talk about good and bad things in our lives. And I would like to say to all of you, you've enriched America. We have more information available to us because of what you do. We can uh, find almost answer to any question when was the Pentagon built. We can share uh, aspects of our lives with those who mean the most to us. And we can talk among ourselves in 140 characters. Some people are better than that than others. Some people should probably do less of it. But the bottom line is uh, these technologies also can be used to undermine our democracy and put our nation at risk. Uh, the platforms that I've just described that add value to, our add value to uh, individual American lives and to our country also can be used by terrorists to recruit in cyber world people to their cause, can be used by foreign governments. We've seen an example of that in 2016 uh, to create chaos within our democracy. Information is power. Uh, ideas are the essence of uh, democracy, the exchange of ideas. Being able to criticize each other is the, one, of the, one of the things that we cherish the most, but what we have to be on guard as a nation is having people who want to undermine our way of life using these platforms um, against us. And I think this is the national security challenge of the 21st century. Here's what General Petraeus said about jihadists online. Jihadists have shown particular facility in exploiting ungoverned or even inadequately governed spaces in the Islamic world. They're also exploiting the vast, largely ungoverned spaces in cyberspace demonstrating increasing technical expertise 
sophistication in media production, and agility in the face of various efforts to, limits, to limit its access. It is clear that our counter-extremism efforts and other initiatives to combat extremism online have, until now, been inadequate. I think that's a fair statement. And the purpose of this hearing is to figure out how we can help you. I believe that each of you, in your own way, are taking the, this, these problems seriously. The one thing I can say without a doubt, what we're doing collectively is not working. You had a foreign government apparently buying thousands of dollars worth of advertising to create discontent and discord in the 2016 election. You have foreign uh, entities going to websites to create fights among Americans, like we don't have enough to fight about on our own. So the bottom line is these platforms are being used by people who wish us harm and wish to undercut our way of life. If you're a man like Putin, democracy is your worst nightmare. If you live in Putin's Russia, the idea of exchanging information about what's good and bad uh, about your government is something you dare not do because you won't last very long. So to those who wish to undermine the American way of life, they found portals into our society that are intermingled with everyday life and the challenge of this hearing and of the, this focus is to how do we keep the good and deal with the bad. We'll never be 100% perfect, but the goal is to be better than we are today. And to the extent that legislation can help, we'd like to know about what we could do to help. To the extent that the status quo is acceptable, we all want to be on the record and say it is not. So with that, I'll turn it over to Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Senator Graham, for uh, organizing this fourth subcommittee hearing into Russia's meddling in the 2016 election. I'm very proud of the work we are doing on this issue. I hope it will continue, and I hope that uh, you and your team see me and uh, my team as uh, loyal partners in this effort. Understanding what happened how Russia applied the varied methods in its election interference toolbox to interfere with our democracy is an important step toward protecting the integrity of future elections and of our democratic process. Each hearing the subcommittee holds gets us closer to that understanding. At our first hearing back in March, we talked about the subcommittee's intent, and I quote, to begin a public conversation about the means and methods Russia uses to undermine democratic government. We heard testimony from expert witnesses who outlined the various tools through which the Kremlin exerts influence abroad, from traditional intelligence methods like compromising corrupt business and political figures, to hacking and leaking stolen information, to disinformation, propaganda, and provocation through both traditional media and social media networks. At a subcommittee hearing in May, I went through a checklist of Russia's toolbox to see which methods had been deployed against the United States in 2016. We'll learn more today about one of those methods, propaganda, fake news, trolls, and bots, from representatives of some major American tech companies and from outside experts. The Russian government exploited social media platforms as part of a wide-ranging disinformation campaign targeted against America and American voters. As we explore how that campaign worked and how we might better insulate ourselves in the future, let's recap what we've learned in our hearings and what we still don't know. We certainly saw the hacking and theft of political information by Russia, something no serious person can dispute. Timed leaks of damaging material were the fruits of that crime. We know they happened, but we still don't know how the decisions were made about what to leak and when and who made them. It's been reported that Trump confidant Roger Stone communicated with Gucci for 2.0 through a cutout. And we learned last week from a press account that the CEO of Cambridge Analytica, a data analytics firm that worked for the Trump campaign, offered assistance to Julian Assange. And of course, we now have the statement of the offense prepared by the Mueller probe. But we don't know the full story of who coordinated with WikiLeaks or even directly with Russian hackers. Another method we've heard about is the exploitation of shady business and financial ties. 
We've heard testimony from a number of witnesses, both here in the subcommittee and at hearings of the Helsinki Commission, that the U.S. has become a haven for secretive shell corporations that can allow foreign influence schemes to channel funds to compromised individuals and exert political influence. We still know next to nothing about the President's business dealings in Russia or with Russians, except that he's long chased after deals there. The President's tax returns would clarify a great deal and hopefully put an end to some of these questions, but those tax returns have not been made public. Paul Manafort's long history of suspicious business relationships with Russian and Ukrainian oligarchs has now yielded his indictment. The indictment exposed gaping holes in FARA enforcement and in picking up on false statements and international money laundering. If you can use his alleged scheme to buy property, why not use it to make anonymous political expenditures or spend money to influence elections? We still don't have answers about the President's curious relationship with Felix Sater, who was chasing Russian business in consultation with senior Trump Organization executive Michael Cohen well after the presidential campaign had begun. We haven't been able to speak with Sater or Cohen, so we still don't have answers on this front. We know that the Russians try to corrupt and compromise political figures in order to exert influence over them. We don't know to what extent that happened here, but we do know the Trump campaign and administration has had a very bad habit of forgetting about meetings with Russians. Michael Flynn is still the only person to have been held accountable for hiding improper contacts with Russia, even as more and more such contacts have emerged in the intervening months. Paul Manafort, Jared Kushner, and the President's son met with a Russian lawyer sent to deliver damaging information about his opponent on behalf of the Russian government in June 2016. Mr. Kushner has apparently amended his security clearance application multiple times to reflect more than 100 foreign contacts he initially left off, including meetings with Ambassador Kislyak, Natalia Veselnitskaya, and the head of a major Russian bank. The leaders of the Judiciary Committee sent letters to the White House in June and July of this year with questions about the status of Mr. Kushner's clearance. To this day, those questions have been ignored. Nearly six months after we first ran through that checklist, we still have more questions than answers. My sincere hope remains that we will find those answers so that we accomplish this subcommittee's primary purpose, which is to help us learn how to protect the country from foreign political influence in our elections. Today, we have an opportunity to learn more about how Russia exploited social media as part of its disinformation campaign and to share some of those details with the public. I appreciate the cooperation of Facebook and Twitter and Google in sending representatives here today and in working with our staff over the last several weeks to voluntarily produce information. The intelligence community assessment published in January reported that, and I quote them here, Moscow's influence campaign followed a Russian messaging strategy that blends covert intelligence operations such as cyber activity with overt efforts by Russian government agencies, state-funded media, third-party intermediaries, and paid social media users or trolls. Russian state-backed networks RT and Sputnik are an important disseminator of messages designed to undermine confidence in the legitimacy of Western institutions and governments. Social media troll armies, like the one operated by the St. Petersburg-based Internet Research Agency, help to amplify those messages, often posing as Americans on Facebook and Twitter, to launder Russian propaganda messages and obscure their Russian origin. According to Ukrainian scholar Anton Shekostov, Russian media, quote, implant propagandist narratives in the international media sphere, and they do so with the express intent of having them picked up on social networks. In Russia's best case scenario, traditional media will then pick up a fake story from social media and give it legitimacy. When narrative laundering is successful, according to Shikovtsov, propagandistic narratives can become part of the mainstream media sphere. How can Western democracies interrupt this vicious, vicious cycle while respecting our commitment to freedom of speech? Greater transparency and disclosure about the source of information, especially paid political advertising, is a necessary first step. But our adversaries have access to tools well beyond traditional political advertising. They are using our own social networks, our friendships, our families, and our biases and viewpoints against us to achieve their political ends. 
I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about the ways we can work with the tech community to ensure that we are prepared to confront Russian disinformation in the future. And again, I express my appreciation to our chairman, Senator Graham. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I very much appreciate your courtesy in uh, permitting just regular members to be here and participate. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Um, I had a briefing last week by outside technical experts, and I saw really for the first time how effectively Russia has harnessed the tremendous and quite frankly to me frightening power of social media. They showed us how millions of Americans are reached and how Russia successfully used fake accounts to embed itself to shape and manipulate opinion and actions. So it shouldn't be news to anyone that Russia interfered in the election. What is really staggering and hard to fully comprehend is how easily and successfully they turned modern technologies to their advantage. Russia used covert cyber attacks to obtain and release information to impact the election as well as propaganda campaigns that relied heavily on RT, formerly Russia Today, the state-run television network, and the Internet Research Agency, a group of professional trolls reportedly financed by a close Putin ally with ties to Russian intelligence. Documents and information that we have received from Facebook, Twitter, and Google confirm this. Just a few more facts. Facebook has identified 470 accounts tied to the Internet Research Agency. Twitter has identified 2,752 IRA-related accounts and almost 37,000 Russian-linked accounts that generated automated election content. From what we have seen so far, Russian-backed trolls use fake accounts on Facebook for more than 3,000 paid advertisements. And those ads sought to sow discord and amplify racial and social divisions among American voters. They exploited hot-button topics such as immigration, gun rights, LGBT, and racial issues to target both conservative and progressive audiences. So, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member, this is really a critical hearing because it's the first time we will have heard, at least to my knowledge, from the three agencies about exactly what is going on and, most importantly, what they are prepared to do to stop it. Thank you very much. One, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, you've been very helpful and very cooperative, and we appreciate it. Uh, to my left, Mr. Colin Stretch is the general counsel for Facebook. Thank you very much for coming. Mr. Sean Edgett is acting general counsel for Twitter. And Mr. Richard Salgado is the director of law enforcement and information security at Google. Rather than reading your resumes, I'm sure you got these jobs because you're very good at what you do, Mr. Stretch. Chairman Graham, Ranking Member Whitehouse, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Colin Stretch, and since July 2013, I have served as the General Counsel of Facebook. We appreciate your hard work as you continue to seek more effective ways to combat crime, terrorism, and all other threats to our national security. We are deeply concerned about all of these threats. At Facebook, we create innovative technology that gives people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. We're proud that over two billion people around the world come to Facebook every month to share with friends and family, to learn about new products and services, to volunteer or donate to organizations they care about, and to help out in a crisis. 
Being at the forefront of technology also means being at the forefront of new legal, security, and policy challenges. Our teams come to work every day to confront these challenges head on. Thousands of Facebook employees around the world work to make Facebook a place where both personal expression and personal safety are protected and respected. I'm here today to address two important issues for our platform and others like it. The threat of extremist content and the efforts by foreign actors to interfere with the 2016 election. Keeping people on safe, excuse me, keeping people safe on Facebook is critical to our mission. And there is no place on Facebook for terrorism or hate. We remove terrorists and posts that support terrorism as soon as we become aware of them. And in the rare cases when we uncover evidence of imminent harm, we promptly inform authorities. While there are challenges to fighting terrorism, we think technology and Facebook can be part of the solution. We also believe we have an important role to play in the democratic process and a responsibility to protect it on our platform. When it comes to the 2016 election, I want to be clear. We take what happened on Facebook very seriously. The foreign interference we saw is reprehensible. That foreign actors hiding behind fake accounts abused our platform and other internet services to try to sow division and discord and to try to undermine the election is directly contrary to our values and goes against everything Facebook stands for. We build tools to help people connect, and we recognize that Facebook has become an important tool for political engagement and debate. Our goal is to bring people closer together. These foreign actors sought to drive people apart. In our investigation, which continues to this day, we have found that foreign actors used fake accounts to place ads on Facebook and Instagram that reached millions of Americans over a two-year period, and that those ads were used to promote pages which in turn posted more content. People shared these posts, spreading them still further. Many of these ads and posts are inflammatory. Some are downright offensive, and much of it will be particularly painful to communities that engaged with this content believing it to be authentic. They have every right to expect more from us, and we are determined to do better. In aggregate, these ads and posts were a very small fraction of the overall content on Facebook, but any amount is too much. All of these accounts and pages violated our policies and we removed them. And going forward, we're making significant investments. We're hiring more ad reviewers, doubling or more our security engineering efforts, putting in place tighter ad content restrictions, launching new tools to improve ad transparency, and requiring more information from political ad buyers. We're building artificial intelligence to help locate more banned content and bad actors. We are working more closely with industry to share information on how to identify and prevent threats so that we can all respond faster and more effectively. And we are expanding our efforts to work with law enforcement. We know bad actors aren't going to stop their efforts. We know we'll all have to keep learning and improving to stay ahead of them. That's why I want to thank you for this investigation. We look forward to the conclusions you will ultimately share with the American public, and I look forward to your questions. Chairman Graham, Ranking Member Whitehouse, and members of the committee, Twitter understands the importance of the committee's inquiry into extremist content and Russian disinformation in the 2016 election, and we appreciate the opportunity to appear here today. The events underlying this hearing have been deeply concerning to our company and to the broader Twitter community. We are committed to providing a service that fosters and facilitates free and open democratic debate and that promotes positive change in the world. We are troubled by reports that power of Twitter was misused by a foreign actor for the purpose of influencing the US presidential election and undermining public faith in the democratic process. The abuse of our platform to attempt state-sponsored manipulation of elections is a new challenge for us, and one that we are determined to meet. Today, we intend to show the committee how serious we are about addressing this new threat by explaining the work we are doing to understand what happened and to ensure it does not happen again. At the time of the 2016 election, we observe instances 
and acted on them of automated and malicious activity. As we learned more about the scope of the broader problem, we resolved to strengthen our systems going forward. Elections continue all the time. So our first priority was to do all we could to block and remove malicious activity from interfering with our users' experience. We created dedicated teams within Twitter to enhance the quality of the information our users see and to block malicious activity wherever and whenever we find it. Those teams continue to work every day to ensure Twitter remains a safe, open, transparent, and positive platform. We have also launched a retrospective review to find Russian efforts to influence the 2016 election through automation, coordinated activity, and advertising. While that review is still underway, we have made the decision to share what we know today in the interest of transparency and out of appreciation for the urgency of this matter. We do so recognizing that our findings may be supplemented as we work with committee staff and other companies, discover more facts, and gain a greater understanding of these events. My written testimony details the methodology and current findings of the retrospective review in detail. We studied tweets from the period September 1 to November 15, 2016. During that time, we did find automated and coordinated activity of interest. We determined that the number of accounts we could link to Russia and that were tweeting election-related content was comparatively small, around 1 one-hundredth of a percent of the total Twitter accounts at the time we studied. One-third of one percent of election-related tweets people saw came from Russian-linked automated accounts. We did, however, observe instances where Russian-linked activity was more pronounced, and we have uncovered more accounts linked to the Russian-based Internet Research Agency as a re result of our review. We also determined that advertising by Russia Today and seven so small accounts was related to the election and violated either the policies that, that existed at the time or that have since been implemented. We have banned all of those users as advertisers, and we will donate that revenue to academic research into the use of Twitter during elections and for civic engagement. We are making meaningful improvements based on our findings. Last week, we announced industry-leading changes to our advertising policies that will help protect our platform from unwanted content. We are also enhancing our safety policies, sharpening our tools for stopping malicious activity, and increasing transparency to promote public understanding of all of these areas. These improvements will further our efforts to fight both terrorist content and disinformation. We will continue confronting these challenges for as long as malicious actors seek to abuse our systems, and we will need to evolve to stay ahead of new tactics. We have heard the concerns about Russian actor, actors' use of, the tw of Twitter to disrupt the 2016 election and about our commitment to addressing this issue. Twitter believes that any activity of that kind, regardless of magnitude, is unacceptable, and we agree we must do better to prevent it. We hope that our appearance today and the description of the work we have undertaken demonstrates our commitment to working with you, our industry partners, and other stakeholders to ensure that the experience of 2016 never happens again. Cooperation to combat this challenge is essential. We cannot defeat this evolving shared threat alone. As with most technology-based threats, the best approach is to combine information and ideas to increase our collective knowledge. Working within the broader community, we will continue to test, to learn, to share, and to improve so that our product remains effective and safe. I look forward to answering your questions. Chairman Graham, Ranking Member of White House, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting us to participate in today's hearing and for your leadership on these challenging and important issues. My name is Richard Salgado. As Director of Law Enforcement and Information Security at Google, I work with the thousands of people across teams at Google tasked with protecting the security of our network and user data. Previously, I had the honor of serving with the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section at the Department of Justice, focusing on computer network crimes and other uh, uh, crimes such as hacking. Google services provide real benefits to our society. We recognize, however, that our services can be misused. State-sponsored attackers are particularly pernicious. They are well-resourced, they are sophisticated, they are patient, 
and often by design, they are difficult to recognize. Protecting our platforms from state-sponsored interference is a challenge we began tackling long before the 2016 presidential election. We've dedicated significant resources to help protect our platforms from such attacks by maintaining cutting-edge defensive systems and by building advanced security tools directly into our consumer products. We also have a range of tools to detect and prevent bad actors from engaging in artificially amplifying content on our platforms. YouTube, for example, uses an array of signals to catch those who try to artificially inflate the view counts of their videos or the number of subscribers on their channels. With respect to the 2016 election, we've been looking across our products to understand whether individuals who appear to be connected to government-backed entities were disseminating information in the U.S. for the purpose of interfering with the election. This was based on research conducted by Alphabet's Jigsaw Group, the investigatory work of our information security teams, and on leads provided by other companies. Our review included a broad review of all ads from June 15th until the election last November that were categorized as potentially political by our systems and had even the loosest connection to Russia, such as a Russian IP address, billing address, or Russian currency. We found two accounts that appeared to be engaged in activity associated with known or suspected government-backed entities. The two accounts rough, uh, spent roughly $4,700 in connection with the 2016 election. <clears throat> Our investigation also focused on other platforms. On YouTube, we found 18 channels with approximately 1,100 videos that were uploaded by individuals who we suspect are associated with this effort and that contained political content. These videos mostly had low view counts. Just 3% of them had more than 5,000 views and constituted only around 43 hours of YouTube content. While this is relatively small, people watch over a billion hours of YouTube content a day, 400 hours of content are uploaded every minute, we understand that any misuse of our platforms for this purpose can be very serious. The YouTube videos were not targeted to any particular segment of the U.S. population, as that's not a feature available in YouTube, but we did observe that links to these videos were frequently posted to other social media platforms. We believe that the relatively limited amount of activity we found is a result of the safeguards that we had in place in advance of the election Google's products also don't lend themselves to the kind of targeting or viral dissemination that these actors seem to prefer. But we are committed to continuing to improve our existing security measures to help prevent that kind of abuse. As part of our commitment, we are making our political advertising more transparent, easier for users to understand, and even more secure. In 2018, we will release a transparency report for election ads and pair that with a library of election and ad content that will be accessible to researchers. Going forward, users will be able to find the name of any advertiser running an election-related ad on search, YouTube, or Google Display Network with one click on an icon above the ad. And we will be increasing the safeguards in place to ensure users are in compliance with our ad policies and laws covering election ads. On the topic of extremist content, we've developed rigorous policies and programs to make sure the use of our platforms to spread hate or incite violence more prohibitive. We use a mixture of technology and human review to enforce our guidelines and continue to invest in this approach. We are committed to doing our part and recognize that we must work together across government, civil society, and the private sector to address these complex issues at their root. We look forward to continuing to work with this committee as it takes on this important issue. Thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, we'll do five-minute rounds and obviously stay as long as, uh, as necessary. So I'll, I'll start here. Uh, what nations do you worry about other than Russia uh, interfering in our elections? Anybody comes to the top of your head there, Mr. Stretch? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. We worry about nation state actors really from around the globe. Starting in 2014, we stood up a threat intelligence team that was dedicated primarily to reviewing uh, and monitoring four attacks from threat actors uh, tied to nation states. Um, 
that work mostly was directed at traditional cybersecurity, uh, account compromise, surveillance, dissemination of stolen information. Um, it's really only recently that we've seen uh, this threat evolve into what we were talking about, what I was talking about in my testimony, this sort of dissemination of misinformation. Uh, in terms of specific countries, it really is uh, a global threat that we think of it. And um, we'd certainly be happy to come back to the committee and, and provide more details on, on specific actors. Is that true for the rest of you? I think that's true for us as well. Um, we, as we said in our written testimony, also see a disproportionate amount of uh, spam or automated accounts coming out of Russia. But our tools and technology are agnostic, obviously, to, to countries. Could Iran and North Korea potentially do this? Certainly, potentially. The internet is, uh, is borderless. Okay. So let's talk about time period. You said you, you started uh, picking up uh, foreign interference two years ago. Is that right, Mr. Stretch? We've been tracking threat actors for, for several years, yes. Before the 2016 election cycle? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Did you find activity after the election? Yes, we did. Okay, what happened after the election? Following the, le the election, the activity we've seen um, really continued uh, in the sense that if you view the activity as a whole, we saw this concerted effort to sow division and discord. Uh, in the wake of the election um, and now President Trump's election, we saw a lot of activity directed at fomenting discord about the validity of his election. So this continued after his election? It continued until we disabled the accounts. Okay. Uh, is that, what about you, Mr. Edgett? Yeah, we saw similar activity. Um, on the advertising side, what was interesting is we saw the activity drop off uh, after the election. Uh, but these automated accounts continue, and so we're continued to focus on making sure that they're removed from our platform. Ms. Salgado. Uh, the, the same is true for Google. It was the limited use of our platforms uh, certainly decreased once we terminated accounts, and we would expect that. Did you see any activity in the primary, Mr. Stretch? The activity that we've now attributed to the Internet Research Agency really started in 2015 and was, was ongoing through the, through the primary, yes. Were these uh, ads pro-Clinton, anti-Clinton, or could you tell? Or these activities? Viewed in the aggregate, the activity, uh, again, really appears to address a wide range of hot button topics and appears directed at, at, at fomenting right. discord and inflaming discourse. In terms of volume, again, what, how much volume are we talking about? About approximately 90% uh, of the volume we saw on the ad side appears to be uh, issues-based. Primarily, a, a much smaller proportion were directed at particular candidates. But in terms of the actual Facebook, I said I think somebody said one in 23,000. I don't know. Maybe that was another company. Correct. So in terms of the total volume of material on the site, it's a very small percentage. We estimate that the Internet Research Agency content uh, was approximately 0.004% of the content in newsfeed uh, during the time period in question. So to sum this up, and I'll come back with the jihadist uh, in round two, uh, Russia as a nation state started interfering in the election cycle back in 2015, uh, and they continued after the election. During the election, they were trying to create discord between Americans, most of it directed against Clinton. After the election, you saw Russian tied groups and organizations trying to undermine President Trump's legitimacy. Is that what you saw on Facebook? I'd say that's an accurate statement. That's an accurate statement. I'm not sure I can characterize uh, on our network which okay. way the uh, okay. content went. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chairman. So um, I take it that we can all agree that the Russians did, in fact, uh, interfere and meddle in the 2016 elections. Your observations on that are consistent with what our intelligence community reports. Is that correct, Mr. Stretch? That, that's correct, Senator. Mr. Edgett? That's correct. Mr. Salgado? That's true. Okay. Um, and I gather that all of your companies have moved beyond any notion that your job is only to provide a platform and whatever goes across it is not your affair. Senator, I, our commitment to addressing this problem is unwavering. We take this very seriously and are committed to investing as necessary to prevent this from happening again. Absolutely. Mr. Edgett? Absolutely agree with Mr. Stretch. And, and this type of activity just creates not only a bad user experience, but distrust for the platform. So we are committed to working every single day to get better at at solving this problem. Mr. Salgado? That's the same for Google. We take this very seriously. We've uh, made changes and we will continue to get better. And ultimately, you are American companies and threats to American election security and threats to American peace and order are things that concern you greatly, correct? That is certainly correct. I agree. That's right. Um, what I would like to do, and I don't have the time for it here, is to ask uh, you all to answer a question for the record that I will ask now, which is give us the key benchmarks of how you have improved at dealing with this problem in recent months or recent years, what your goal posts are ahead that you've not yet achieved but you're slated uh, or intend to achieve to deal with this problem. Uh, that's two. And three would be, what does success look like to you? What can you come to us and say, we have accomplished X, and therefore you as a Congress don't need to worry about legislating in this space or creating regulations or holding more hearings because we have now got America's back. Can you do that for me? Yes. You are all also corporations that have, uh, I believe, headquarters and significant operations in the state of California. California has a state law regarding disclosure. Presumably, you comply with that state law with regard to uh, customers in California. Um, are there lessons and recommendations that you would have for us in evaluating the effectiveness of the California disclosure law. And given the short amount of time I have, I suppose we should give, give, give me a, just a very, very brief, do you follow that law and, and a very brief uh, response to it, and then we can flesh out in a question for the record how much of a model that might be for this committee to look at. So, Senator, we, we comply certainly with, with all applicable law. In terms of disclosure going forward, we made an announcement uh, last week that really drew on some of the ideas from uh, the Honest Ads Act, which, uh, which Senator Klobuchar had, had introduced, uh, intended to uh, bring ads transparency um, really into the political realm, um, creating a repository of searchable ads, providing innovative ways to enable advertisers to meet their disclosure requirements, and requiring documentation and information so that we can ensure that advertisers are not running political ads uh, on, on, on Facebook in violation of federal election law. So let me ask what I will probably be my last uh, question um, of this round anyway, which is that you are all prepared, as I understand it, to undertake to make sure that you can trace content that goes across your platform that qualifies for concern uh, in this area back to a legitimate source. So you know if it's a Russian who's actually running it, so you know if it's an imaginary entity that's actually running it. How do you deal with the problem of a legitimate and lawful but phony American shell corporation? One that calls itself, say, Americans for Puppies and Prosperity has a Dropbox as its address and a $50 million check in its bank book that it is using to spend to manipulate election outcomes. Start with Mr. Edgett this time, because we got Mr. Stretch last time. Uh, I think that's a problem. We're continuing to look into sort of how do you get to know your client. So 
we are also, like uh, Mr. Stretch said, proud of the work we've done around ads transparency and the ads transparency center that we're building and think that kind of center really allows the, the American citizen to be educated about who is, who is running an ad, who is paying for the ad, what other ads that they're, they're putting out into the world and what they're targeting and believe that we'll have to figure out a, a good process to understand who those customers actually are that are signing the contract with Twitter to run ads. You admit that if you trace it all the way back to an American corporation, let's call it Americans for Puppies and Prosperity, and it's actually a shell corporation, you don't know who's behind it. It could be Vladimir Putin, it could be a big, powerful American special interest, it could be the uh, North Koreans or the Iranians. You need to be able to penetrate the obscurity of the shell corporation, correct? We're, we're, yeah, we're working on the best approach to getting to know the, the clients and getting to know who's behind the the entities that are signing up for, for advertising. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, on our side, it's Sam Grassley, Pass the Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to both of the senators for leading this discussion, <clears throat> and thanks to the companies for their cooperation. The press has reported that the Russian government placed ads in Facebook that were largely aimed at influencing the election. So I want to highlight what I consider an inaccuracy in that reporting, the committee is reviewing the ads that Facebook produced. Overall, the ads do not support a specific candidate, uh, either Republican or Democrat, and about half of the ads my staff have reviewed were placed after the election. The large majority exploits uh, controversial issues in our country in an effort to further divide us as a country. For example, some ads target users in Ferguson, Baltimore, and Cleveland. These ads spread stories about abuse of black Americans by law enforcement. These ads are clearly intended to worsen racial tensions and possibly violence in those cities. It might be true that these ads were intended to influence elections, but it's important to be clear that the nature of the ads. Russia does not have loyalty to a political party in the United States. Their goal is to divide us and discredit our democracy. So question for you, Mr. Stretch. The ads that Facebook has produced are all about, uh, all from inter Internet Research Agency. What is Facebook doing to identify ads and contents placed by other bad actors? Thank you, question. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, we are focused broadly on addressing questions of authenticity around the content that's placed on our platform and the investments we're making around. Uh, around security and around transparency sweep across the entire platform. So for example, the learning that we uh, gained from the 2016 election and from our expansive investigation into it now informs the automated tools that we use to detect and remove fake accounts from anywhere. Okay. Uh, has Facebook produced all the ads and contents it has located from Russian sources that were placed prior to the election and if Facebook has not, will Facebook focus on producing those ads? Yes, Senator, we have identified everything. We've produced everything that we've identified that is the product of, of what we call coordinated inauthentic activity yeah. from Facebook. Uh, and we are continuing to investigate and we, we commit to keep the committee up to date so, on any, any further progress in our investigation. And so that would include all ads, uh, all ads placed from re Russian sources? All ads from Russian sources that- as Well as others. That are inauthentic and directed at these political issues. There are, of course, okay. you know, many advertisements cross border for okay. legitimate purposes that, okay. that we have not produced. Overall, Facebook identified more than 3,000 ad purchases worth 100,000 during the 2016 election that had links to Russia. Russian agents posted messages that reached 126 million users. The ads, accounts, and posts that Facebook found attempted to amplify divisive political issues across the political spectrum. Twitter identified around 200 accounts linked to Russian groups um, identified by Facebook. Russia Today, or RT, as it's sometimes called, spent approximately 274,000 targeting U.S. markets uh, 2016. Russian agents published more than 131,000 messages on Twitter. Google found tens of thousands of ads buys by Russian accounts that use YouTube or Google. 
uh, Russian agents uploaded about uh, 1,000 videos on YouTube. So questions to each of you and a short answer on uh, these uh, two questions I'm going to put together. Uh, to each company, starting with Mr. Stretch, have you completed internal investigations to identify all accounts, advertisements, and posts with connections to Russia that purchase ads in the lead up to the 26th election? And if not, what is the timeline for completion? Senator, as I stated in my testimony, the investigation continues, um, and we expect to keep the committee up to date on any further discoveries. Okay. The same goes for Twitter. Uh, we, we are continuing to work with your staff on both, uh, we, you know, our relevant period was September 1st and November 15th. We're working with your staff on other investigations okay. you'd like to see. And for Google, the answer is similar. As our okay. investigation continues, we'll keep the committee up to date. Okay. And then uh, one that I would like to have you write and uh, give me answers in writing. Could you provide an update on what your internal investigations have found? Please specific, be specific in regard to the number of accounts and total value of the advertisements. My time's up, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Stretch, uh, we know that Russian operatives built misleading pages like Black Matters U.S. and United Muslims of America to attract Facebook users. They then exploited a powerful Facebook tool called Custom Audiences to track down those users and send them targeted messages. Can you explain who was targeted using Facebook's Custom Audiences tool? Thank you for the for the question, Senator. Um, as a as a threshold matter, you're you're correct that much of the content we've seen is essentially imitative of uh, of social causes, very meaningful ones to many members of of the of the community and the Facebook community, and it's 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 what makes I think this content so vile, so upsetting, so cynical. Its attempt to uh, exploit divisions in our society. In terms of the advertising tools that were used to promote these pages uh, that were masquerading, essentially, um, the advertising targeting that was used in the main was a combination of very broad geographic targeting. Most of the ads, about 75% of the corpus we've given you, was targeted to the United States as a whole. And about a quarter of the ads were targeted um, at a more granular level on, uh, to states. Um, and they were targeted to interest groups. So we have various uh, what we call like-based or interest-based targeting that was apparently intended to attract people who were following the causes right. you've identified right. to subscribe to those pages. Thank you. And what have you done with the tool since? Thank you for the question. It's an important one for us because we do believe these tools are powerful and yet we have a responsibility to make sure they're not used to inflame division. So what we're doing is, is making a number of changes to our ad targeting policies. We're tightening the, the restrictions on hate speech and ads generally. We're uh, adding additional layers of review where people use potentially sensitive categories for targeting. And we're also limiting the ad content permissions so that uh, where, our tar where ads are uh, directed at potentially divisive issues, we're trying to uh, tighten our standards to make sure that they're not targeting individuals or communities. Thank you, I appreciate that. Mr. Salgado, why did Google, Google give preferred status to Russia Today, a Russian propaganda arm on YouTube? Uh, there was a, a period of time uh, where Russia Today qualified, really because of algorithms, to participate in a, an advertising program uh, that opened up some inventory for them. It's objective standards uh, around popularity and some other uh, criteria to be able to participate in that program. Uh, ad, the, ad platforms or, or publishers like RT drop in and out of the program uh, as things change, and, and that is the case with RT. They dropped out of the program. 
Well, why didn't you revert RT's preferred status after the ICA came out in January 2017? It took you to September of 2017 to do it. The, the removal of RT from the program was actually a result of, as, as I understand it, is a, is a result of some of the drop in viewership, not as a result of, of any action otherwise. So uh, there, was, there was nothing about uh, RT or its uh, content that uh, uh, meant that it stayed in or stayed out. Okay, a quick one for Twitter. Twitter produced images from tweets that contained false voting information. Example, telling voters they could vote by sending a text message, all targeting likely Clinton voters just before the election. Twitter initially responded to complaints, saying Twitter had, quote, determined that it was not in violation of our rules. Twitter has said there was no obvious Russian origin. The posts were removed only after Twitter's CEO was directly notified by a Twitter user. That's the facts as I understand them. Why was this false content allowed to remain in place? My understanding is once we had user reports of the content, we began to remove it as a legal uh, voter suppression. Uh, and the interesting thing about the text to vote tweets that we shared with, you, with your staff was uh, there was a small amount of tweets relative to the size of, of the platform, but impressions of tweets calling out those things as fake were eight times as large. We had 10 times the amount of retweets calling those things out as could, fake. Could you say that again? Impressions, I, I don't quite understand. Oh, thank you. you. Thank you. Great question. Okay. And so we're all on the same page. Imp impressions is a metric we use to determine whether or not a tweet has been in view on our product, so potentially seen by, by, a, uh, by a user. But the interesting thing about the text to vote tweets were that we saw a complete counter narrative around them, the Twitter community coming together and seizing on them to let everyone know that they were, that they were fake. But, that, but Twitter did action those tweets and remove them from the platform. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask some questions to get at metrics. So can we start with you, Mr. Edgett? And for, for Twitter, can you walk us through how many accounts there are, how many users there are, how many are anonymous, how many are fake as a subset of both anonymous and purportedly real? So we have 330 million uh, monthly active users uh, and that we, we just reported a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, we track things internally like... Um, you say 330 million? Da daily active users uh, also look at things like impressions. Um, we estimate that less than 5% of Twitter uh, users are potentially um, false accounts or, or spam or, or automated. So less than 5%? Less than 5% overall. And can you distinguish between fake and automated? Because wouldn't there be accounts that real people would run, but for, you can imagine, business cycle purposes where you'd have accounts that are automated but aren't fake? Right. So we, we yeah, great. Thank you for letting me distinguish that. We look at whether or not an account is spam or automated based on whether it looks like there's a human behind it or not. We don't try to, we can't calculate in some instances whether someone is pretending to be someone that they're not. We have a pseudonymous uh, policy that allows you to come on and create your own name. It doesn't have to be the one that you have. So in that instances, we can't, we can't track those metrics. And if you break down though, in political Twitter, it sure looks like there are a whole bunch of people that have 5,000 issues. Or they're, five, they're following 5,000, and they've got 5,000. They're following 5,000, and they have 5,000 followers. And it looks like many of these accounts that are the sort of most laughably fake um, are self-referential, that they're retweeting back and forth at each other. When you uh, evaluate impressions numbers, do you have some way of quantifying which impressions are likely inside the universe of the 95% that you think are real users? And is that how you prioritize? trying to figure out where the big problems are? Uh, we, we prioritize, we obviously prioritize automated activity. You saw that in the written testimony. It's a way for malicious actors to sort of get their voice out. So the instance that you, you discuss where it looks like there's just a lot of retweeting among a circle of, of followers. Some of that can be positive and natural if you have a number of friends that you're following and you're all interested in the same thing. Some of it can be malicious and automated. Uh, our tools are getting better each day to determine what is malicious, what is automated, what's, what's not actually real. We're able to see the distinction between how a real human tweets versus how a, a robot tweets. Um, 
So we're working on redoubling our efforts on, on that regard. And I want to go to Facebook quickly too, but it, it would seem to me that there's a pretty big distinction between objectively verifiable fake things, the, the text to vote right. or fake voter information or voter location or voter hours, and things that are narrative based where people have competing different world, competing world views and differing interpretations of how facts fit in some overarching narrative of, you know, actual good versus evil and then merely political versions that are the, the subset of those debates. How do you rank order what you should focus on and what's the human capital that you have doing this? So Russia and China and potentially North Korea, Iranian examples are uh, sort of straightforward in the context of the way we've been debating it in the US election, but in the context of potentially jihadi accounts, there's a whole range of the theological interpretation about people who don't quite believe in violence in the name of religion and people who think that's a threshold that, religion, that a certain theology requires of them. Who are your people who do this work? So we, we prioritize safety and abuse. It's the number one priority of the company. And earlier this year, we, we actually repivoted all of our engineering product and design teams to solve this problem set. So that's our number one priority. As a subset of that are things like automated accounts being used by malicious actors to sort of amplify their voice. Uh, we have hundreds, and in, the ter in terms of our entire engineering organization, sometimes thousands. Um, we're a company of about 3,800 employees. So over like half of them are focused on this problem at, at certain times uh, throughout our life cycle. But uh, sort of understanding the intricacies of jihadi theology is not something that an engineer is exactly trained to do. So no. who, who are your content experts by domain? How do we, you do? How do you hire for that? We have a we have a very respected trust and safety team who who has to re research these issues around the world. We're a global platform being used everywhere except for a few places. Um, so we have, we have teams that are researching these issues and trying to dis distinguish what you're talking about between violent groups and groups that may have some connection to them but are more political arms. We've seen many instances of that. Uh, so there are teams who have to sort of tease out the nuances and understand how these groups are acting and how they're coordinating at times. But there are, there are teams that, that research and study these issues and also help us refine and implement new policies around them. Thank you. Mr. Stretch, uh, I'll save some metrics questions for you after the hearing or a subsequent round, but can you tell us just a little bit about Facebook's human capital solution to the same problem? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Senator, for the question. So today, uh, across our uh, safety, security, and product and community operations teams, we have about 10,000 people who are working on safety and security generally, and we're committing to investing more and doubling that number by the end of 2018. On the question of extremist content generally, I think you raise a really important point, which is that we need to understand the behavior and we need to have the capacity both as a company and as an industry to be able to track it and eradicate it. So we have thousands of people who who as part of their job on a regular basis are, are attempting to keep terrorism off of Facebook. We have 150 people who do nothing else. That's their job. And across that 150 people, they have, as Mr. Edget suggested, uh, in our case as well, significant expertise in understanding jihadi threats. They cover about 30 separate languages. One of the things that each of us has done as a company has worked together to make sure that the industry is sharing threat information and sharing expertise and also providing that information to other smaller companies that may not have the same level of resources. We all agree, not just that terrorism doesn't have a place on Facebook, terrorism has no place on the internet. And we're trying to lead the industry to make sure that we're all doing our part to address that threat. And the last point I'll make is that it also requires an ongoing dialogue with law enforcement, with the government, because there's a, a great wealth of information in the government as it tracks these issues that they can share with us. And that, in turn, gives me some optimism as we address the question of foreign interference in the election. We know how to work together to address a threat on the internet, both as an industry and working with government. And I think if we bring that same concerted behavior to bear looking at this threat of foreign interference in the election, I think we'll make some progress. Thanks, I ran past my time, but I'll follow up with you more as well on your team, thanks. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, thanks to all of you on the panel. Last, Mr. Stretch, last night, 19 major civil rights organizations sent a letter to Facebook which explained their, quote, deep concern regarding ads, pages, and hateful content on your platform used to divide our country, and in particular to promote anti-Muslim, anti-black, anti-immigrant, anti-LGBTQ anti anti animus. 
The organizations referenced a number of examples that had previously been reported by the media, including a Russian Facebook account that, quote, not only promoted anti-immigrant messaging online, but also managed to organize an in-person anti-refugee rally in Twin Falls, Idaho in August of 2016. The letter also detailed a reported situation in which, quote, Facebook offered its expertise to a bigoted advocacy group by creating a case study testing different video formats and advising on how to enhance the reach of the group's anti-refugee campaign in swing states during the final weeks of the 2016 election. What is your response to this letter? Is it true that Facebook assisted in an anti-Muslim effort? Thank you, thank you, Senator, for the question. So let me start by saying that the, the content that we've produced to this committee uh, and that was run by these uh, fake accounts masquerading as real authentic uh, identities uh, is vile. And it's vile for precisely the reason you say. It's particularly exploitative insofar as it was directed at groups that uh, have um, uh, every reason to expect us to protect the authenticity of, of, of debate on Facebook. In terms of what we're doing in, in response, we are, we are reviewing and tightening our ad policies and, and there's two particular changes that, that we're making. One is we are, we are, we are tightening our uh, content guidelines as they apply to ads with respect to violence. So much of the content that is so disturbing is involves uh, threats of violence towards communities, and that has no place on Facebook, and it certainly has no place. Regardless of source? Re uh, regard yes, regardless of source. Um, regardless of source, exactly. We want our ad tools uh, to be used for uh, political discourse, certainly, but we are not. We do not want our ad tools to be used to inflame and divide. Well, that's the point I'm trying to get to. Is I read that set of facts to you, uh, the trigger word was a Russian Facebook account. At which point, most of us would say, "Hold, hold the mm -hmm. phone. What is Russia doing, promoting anti-immigrant, anti-refugee sentiment in the United States?" Now take the word Russian out of it. Mm -hmm a Facebook account that promotes anti-immigrant, anti-refugee sentiment in the United States. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you would characterize that as vile. I sure would. These groups would. What I'm trying to get to is this. I think we can all, when we start with the word Russian, fake, trolls, bots, so forth, right. we know the starting point is a trigger. Something needs to be done. The second thing we know is if it includes a reference to a political candidate or a party, mm -hmm. then it's in a category two of electioneering. I'll let Senator Klobuchar address that issue. I'm sure she will in a, mo a moment or two. And then the third question gets into what you characterize in this case as vile content. Mm -hmm. How are you going to sort this out consistent with the basic values of this country when it comes to freedom of expression? Mm -hmm. it, it's a great, it's a great question. I, 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 don't, I don't suggest it's easy. Uh, we do value personal expression and when that is the purpose of your service, there is going to be content that is objectionable, even beyond objectionable. Where we're really trying to draw the line is with, with respect to uh, uh, advertising content and using our tools to, um, to, to promote messages I'm gonna and promote pages. I'm going to stipulate these are all ads. I'm going to stipulate right. that at the beginning. They're yes. all ads. Yes. They are being purchased to affect an outcome of an election or a voter sentiment or to mislead voters. I'd like to ask your colleagues to address this as well. Mr. Edgett, what would Twitter say to that question? Uh, those ads have no place on Twitter and our ads policies actually address those things. So if there's inflammatory content that, that, that's, that some even would find to be upsetting, that's not the type of ad we want running on Twitter. We distinguish between organic tweets, which are those that you or I or anyone here today can tweet from their, from their phone or computer, from advertising. Advertising are tweets that are serving to someone who hasn't asked to follow the content, hasn't asked to be a part of that conversation. So we draw a very hard line on making sure advertisements are not inflammatory. I, I certainly commend you and endorse that, but agree with Senator Sass that when it comes to drawing those lines, it's a challenge for us and we do it for a living. 
uh, and I think it'll be a challenge for you as well. Mr. Salgado, would you like to comment on that? I, I agree that it's a, a real challenge. We have policies to keep our ads and, and the uh, uh, high quality, uh, and the, uh, the proposals we've made and that we'll be implementing around election ad transparency, I think, reflect that as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I'm very proud that the three companies you're representing here today are American companies. And, and I think you do enormous good. But your power sometimes scares me. Um, Mr. Stretch, how many advertisers does Facebook have? We have uh, approximately 5 million advertisers on a monthly basis, Senator. Did China run ads in the last election cycle that tried to impact our election? Not, not that I'm aware of, Senator. Not that you're aware of. Did Turkmenistan? No, no Senator. Not that I'm aware of. We have... How about North Korea? Turn that off. I'm, I'm not aware of... of other foreign actors running the same sort of campaign. How can you be aware? I mean, this is, this is what I mean. You've got five million advertisers, and you're going to tell me that you're able to trace the origin of all of those advertisements? If, if, I, wanted, if I want to hire a lawyer, if I wanted to hire you when you were in private practice, you have an incredible resume, and say, let's go through about four shell corporations. I want to run some ads, and let's go through four or five shell corporations because I want to hide my identity. You're telling me you have the ability to, to, uh, to go to, to trace through all of these corporations and find the true identity of every one of your advertisers. You're not telling me that, are you? Senator, the, the commitment we are making no, is... No, sir, I'm just asking about your ability. Not commitment. Can right. you do it today? We're not able to see beyond the activity we see on the platform, the, the technical signals that we get from an account. Now, we do think that, that the technical signals we, we see can be used to help us identify inauthentic behavior. The truth but of in the matter of is, I'm trying to get us down from La La Land here. The truth of the matter is you have 5 million advertisers that change every month, every minute, probably every second. You don't have the ability to, to know who every one of those advertisers is, do you? Today, right now, not your commitment. I'm asking about your ability. To, to, to your question about seeing essentially behind the platform to understand if there are shell corporations, of course, the answer is, is no. We cannot see behind the activity. Let, let me ask you something else. Um, if, if I came to you, I don't mean just to pick on you, but... I don't have enough time to do all three of you, so you two gentlemen get to skate. Um, if I came to you and said, look, I want to I I wanna buy an ad that everybody sees on Facebook, that's going to be cost prohibitive. Can we agree on that? That's likely the case, Senator, yes. yes. So I've got to narrow it down. And you can help me narrow it down because that's your business model. You collect data and lease it out to companies who use that data to sell people, products, services, and candidates. Isn't that basically your business model? Senator, we, we do provide targeted advertising. We don't actually share the, the data of individuals right. with that. Do you have a profile on me? Senator, uh, if you're a Facebook user, um, we would permit you to be targeted um, with an advertisement based on, on your characteristics and your likes along with other people who share similar well, characteristics. Well, let me put it another way. Let's suppose likes. your CEO came to you, not you, but somebody who could do it in your company, maybe you could, and said, I want to know everything we can find out about Senator Graham. I want to know the movies he likes. I want to know the bars he goes to. I want to know who his friends are. I want to know where, what schools he goes, went to. You could do that, couldn't you? So, 
and I want to be, it's, it is a very good question. You the can answer, do that though, can't you? The answer is absolutely not. We have limitations in place on our ability to, to no, no, review no, I'm not the personal about your, your, your rules. I'm saying you have the ability to do that, don't you? Again, Senator, the, the answer is, is no. We're not, we're not you able to. You can't put to. a name to a face to a piece of data? You're telling me that? So we have designed our systems to prevent exactly that, to protect the privacy of our users. I understand, but there, you can get around that to find that, that identity, can't you? No, Senator, I cannot. That's your testimony under oath. Yes, it is. Okay. So, so I'm about out of time. I'm going to take one more minute or one more 30 seconds. Uh, are you a media, let me ask Google this to be fair. Are you a media company or a neutral technology platform? Uh, we, we're uh, a technology platform primarily. That's what I thought you'd say. Yeah. You, don't think you're, you don't think you're one of the largest news, the largest newspaper in 92 countries? Uh, we're not a newspaper. We're a platform for uh, sharing of information that can include news from sources such as newspapers. Isn't that what newspapers do? Uh, this is a, a platform from which news can be read from news sources. I'm way over. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm not going to ask what bar you go to. Don't be concerned. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to both of you for this important hearing. Um, so I come at this just with this simple idea that our democracy was formed to be self-governing, and that means uh, we don't want foreign entities influencing decisions uh, that our citizens make, and they have a right, uh, a right of freedom to make their own decisions, and I think that was interfered with uh, by influence uh, by Russians and also by others when there's no rules in place uh, to tell us uh, where these ads, paid ads, are coming from. And so I do appreciate the efforts uh, from these uh, companies, but I just, I don't think it's enough. We're gonna have a patchwork of ads uh, from different companies. Some won't be doing any, some will be doing one thing, another will be doing another. Um, and we wouldn't have actual enforcement, and management can change and decisions changes. And so that's why I think it's very important that we have the same rules of the road uh, for these issue ads as well as candidate ads uh, that we have for TV, radio, and print. It's that simple. And that is the bill uh, that uh, Senator Warner and I have and that Senator McCain is our co-sponsor and we're uh, very pleased with that. And he looks at this as a national security issue. Uh, so my first question uh, is simply, uh, will you support our bill? Mr. Stretch. Thank you, Senator, for the, for the question. So first, we're not we're not waiting for legislation, as I as I explained earlier. But just if you could just answer that, if you will support our bill, and if not, why not? Well, we've drawn on uh, on much of what's in the bill that to inform our announcement on uh, on Friday uh, related to ads transparency and disclosure obligations, and we stand ready to to, to work with you um, and your co-sponsors uh, uh, on that legislation going forward. Mr. Edgett from Twitter. The same goes for Twitter. Uh, yeah, we, we certainly support the, the goals of the legislation and uh, would like to work through the nuances to make it work for all of us. Okay, because just to clarify, while you are taking responsibility uh, for a lot of what's happened here and trying to make some changes, there wouldn't be an outside enforcer of any of your policies, right? It'll just be you. Is that true? Is that? Not you personally, but your companies. Okay, can someone answer? Sorry. That's correct. Okay. And, um, and also, uh, no one has said yet uh, that they will include issue ads, right? And that is what we've just heard from Mr. Stretch, 90% of the uh, Russian paid political ads were issue ads. Um, and as you know, somehow the radio station in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, is able to figure out what an issue ad is under the federal guidelines. And I would just hope that your companies could do that because um, the way our election system works is that campaigns are able to see each other's ads, um, and also uh, the journalists and the public are able to see the ad. So um, that has been a stumbling block so far. And so it, is this a problem that you're not gonna be able to figure out those rules like TV broadcast and radio? And I'm just trying to understand that. So as we announced last week, uh, SU ads are sort of a 2.0 or next version for us and something that we're thinking hard about how to 
how to operationalize and how, what rules to put around it and to determine what is an issue ad on a platform like ours versus what's an ad unrelated to, to an election. So we're, we're thinking hard about that. We don't have anything to announce today, but we're hoping to announce something soon. Okay. Mr. Stretch, anyone want to add anything on that? I just want to, uh, we have had clarification on this. Um, it's FCC clarification, encompasses political issues that are the subject of continuing controversy or discussion at the national level, national debt, defense. And we just haven't, you know, people see ads all the time on energy, they see ads on uh, immigration policy, on all kinds of things. and they're able to just simply, we see disclaimers of who's paying for them, and we know where they're running. And that's what we're trying to get at here, because as brilliant as your companies are, and they are incredibly brilliant, and they have employed so many people, uh, we happen to believe that if you make these things public, which is the goals of your companies, is to share information, you're going to have other sets of eyes that are able to look at those ads. So I, I want you to uh, look at it uh, from that perspective. I had one question, um, Mr. Stretch, and that is you've appreciated that you guys put out there that the 126 million people had uh, access to those uh, Russian ads. And were those originally paid ads and then they got shared and liked and, and went through the system? How did that work? Thank you, Senator. There's, there's really two categories of content. Uh, there were ads, about 3,000 of them, that appeared uh, those the paid for by rubles ads. Uh, many of them were paid for by rubles. Are there other ads that the Russians may have run that weren't paid for by rubles? So the the, I believe the content you're referring to is what we think of as organic content. So the ads were used to essentially drive followership of pages, and then pages themselves post unpaid content um, that people who have followed the page are eligible to see, and the the. The 126 million number refers to the latter. It refers to the unpaid or organic posts over the approximately two-year period that okay, these but pages my last were active. Question, because we need to move on, my colleagues. Um, isn't it often the case, though, that candidates or issue groups will get an organic-looking ad? It doesn't have a disclaimer on it, and then they boost it. Right? They pay, so they're really doing a paid ad. But on TV, you would know it's a paid ad, but not on your platform. It, it's a great. It's a great. Question, Senator. Everything that's boosted or promoted in that way is designated as sponsored today, and that's the case. Um, so it would it would have shown up as sponsored if it was paid, regardless of whether it related to a candidate or an issue. What we're doing going forward would capture that in the sense that we are creating a transparency mechanism for all pages. You go to the page and you can see every single ad that's that's running. So but right now you're just doing candidate ads and not the issues ads and 90% of the ads the Russians bought were issued. With 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 respect to what a a user could see if they navigate to the page, they would see all of them, every single ad from every single advertiser. So it does sweep much more broadly than that. And we are also focused on making sure that in the political space if there are disclosure obligations for the advertiser that relate to issue ads, as you've described, we're going to enable that. So the innovative ways we've, we're working on to make sure that okay. candidates can satisfy their obligations will cover that category. Well, we'll revisit this on a second round, but obviously it'd be easier if everyone had the same rules, and we would all know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for holding the hearing. Thank you for your testimony. And I'm sorry if I'm plowing old ground here. I missed the first part of it. Uh, with regard to threat detection, uh, just to find out what's out there, I believe, uh, Facebook, you have uh, algorithms that uh, do the first run and, and humans that it, it kicks to a set of humans to look at it. And I understand that you've increased the number of humans who do look at these kind of things. Can you explain the process that you have? Thank you, Senator. It is, it is certainly true that in uh, ensuring the security of the site, we rely on systems and people. Um, we have uh, invested and we are investing heavily on both fronts with respect to the sort of what I'll call the sort of uh, particularized threat actors. Um, that are typically associated with nation states. That's a highly manual process. So we will, for example, have a threat indicator that we're tracking. And then if we see activity, that's really a, 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 a highly intensive uh, manual effort 
to, to police and try to understand the activity and essentially fan out from there. The systems are, are quite effective at identifying uh, more, call it run of the mine, um, uh, abusive behavior. So uh, fake accounts that are springing up quickly with the purpose of, of spreading spam can be recognized by our systems, usually pretty readily and disabled without that sort of human intervention. Uh, t what's Twitter's policy there? How does uh, that differ? Same kind of thing, algorithms, and then uh, kicks yeah. it to a human set. That's, that's right. We're, we're very focused on the behavior of the account and some a lot of the signals we can see sort of behind the public-facing platform. Uh, so we look at activity, like Mr. Stretch said, that looks very apparent, not very opposite of what a natural person would be doing, signing up for a lot of accounts within seconds, you know, liking or retweeting a lot of things within seconds. And that's where we can identify a lot of this automated activity and take it off our platform. The, the same is true. The, the desire is to move as much of this as we can because of the scale we operate at uh, to machine learning. Over time, it gets smarter, we get new signals, we educate the uh, automated portion of the process so that it's faster and higher quality, but we always have human review on the other side of it to handle the, the issues that are novel uh, or where there's some gray area. Is it, uh, obviously, you've undertaken these, uh, these, these means without, all three of you, without government telling you you have to do it? Um, is there, a, business model that says, let's take care of this? Is it in your economic interest to take care of this, all of you? Starting with Facebook. Senator, we believe that authenticity is really a cornerstone of what we do, and preventing the platform from being used for abuse is our responsibility, and we're, we're committed to meeting that responsibility. Twitter? Absolutely the same at Twitter. We believe that we shouldn't have automated malicious actors on the platform. It's a it's a bad experience for the user, if you ask about the business case. Um, and we want to be known as, as a platform for promoting debate and discussion, and having interferences of, of automated accounts is not something that we, we wanted on, on Twitter. Yeah, the philosophy for Google is that uh, if it weren't an ethical and moral imperative, which it is, it's certainly a business imperative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Graham and um, Ranking Member Whitehouse, and I'd like to thank our three witnesses for joining us today. Uh, I think what you've presented today is truly troubling evidence um, of the scope and reach of Russia's interference in our last election and the ways in which Americans who typically expect to know when they're consuming a political advertisement were misled and what are very troubling um, slow halting steps by your otherwise compelling and innovative companies uh, to come forward and to work with us and to help us understand the scope and consequence of this. Mr. Stretch, let me start, if I could, with a political ad from Facebook. Uh, this is an ad that was run on Facebook in May of 2016, a key moment in the primary campaigns of both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, when both were closing in on the nomination. A group that claimed to be part of Texas, you can see in the upper left, but was in fact paid for by Russians in rubles, used this ad to target Americans based on their professed characteristics, like an interest in patriotism or supporting veterans. The ad claims that Hillary Clinton is, quote, only one politician except Barack Obama who is despised by the overwhelming majority of American veterans. And it says if Clinton were elected president, the, quote, army should be withdrawn from her control according to amendments to the Constitution. This ad is nothing short of the Russian government directly interfering in our elections, lying to American citizens, duping folks who believe they are joining and supporting a group that is about veterans and based in Texas when in fact it's paid for in rubles by Russians. Should Facebook be allowed to be a platform that foreign adversaries can use to run political ads, sir? Senator. That advertisement has no place on Facebook, and we are committed to preventing that sort of behavior from uh, occurring again on our platform. It's something we take incredibly seriously. I think you're right to surface it. It's upsetting. It makes 
me angry. It makes everybody who works at the company angry. When I said we are doubling our teams from 10,000 to 20,000 in order to address safety and security on Facebook, that's exactly the sort of thing I'm Mr. talking Stretch, about. Mr. Stretch, thank you for that answer. Let me show you another example. There's been a lot of attention on ads, but I think we also ought to focus on events. Uh, Russians also used Facebook uh, to make up and promote political events. Uh, a group called Being Patriotic, see the upper left, shared their event, a Miners for Trump rally to users in Pennsylvania. But again, this political event was in fact a fraud, um, organized, funded, and supported by Russians. Uh, Russians trying to influence our election duped Americans in Pennsylvania into coming to an event that was nothing but a fake. Help me understand, if I might, Mr. Stretch, uh, you've said that these things are vile and upsetting and, and cynical uh, and that you take responsibility for changing. Uh, yet I'm concerned that we are now nearly a year after the election. Uh, Ten months after the election, September 6th, Facebook acknowledged $100,000 worth of ads were bought by a Russian company linked to the Kremlin, amounting to about 3,000 ads. But if I understand your testimony here today, it's that 80,000 posts by the Russian-linked Internet Research Agency were seen by 29 million Americans and may have reached an estimated 126 million people. Why has it taken Facebook 11 months to come forward and help us understand the scope of this problem, see it clearly for the problem it is, and begin to work in a responsible legislative way to address it when former President Obama cautioned your CEO literally nine days after the election last November that this was a big problem and Facebook needed to come forward? Thank you, Senator. I, I, I appreciate the, 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 the question. The, the one clarification, when, when President Obama and Mr. Zuckerberg met and spoke, they were speaking about fake news generally. There was no discussion of foreign interference. But I think your larger point around our efforts to investigate and understand what we now see as a sophisticated and systemic effort to interfere in the election is one I, I do want to address. We actually published a white paper in April of 2017 that detailed our findings to that point. When the Office of the Director of National Intelligence issued its assessment in January, we weren't sitting around. Our threat intelligence team, which I had which I mentioned earlier, had been looking at what we could learn from the 2016 election. And on the basis of that assessment, which we saw in January, started looking hard at the question of disinformation on Facebook and identified a number of practices that we thought would be helpful for the industry to be aware of and for the public to be aware of. So we publicly, issue, we publicly issued that white paper in April. Now, as you roll the clock forward and we continued our investigation, we did further analysis, and we did then discover the ads associated with the Internet Research Agency, and at that moment, we brought those, we brought those advertisements uh, and our learnings to Congress. We issued a public blog post telling the public what we had found, and we committed to continuing our investigation and continuing to, com to, uh, to commit to share what we learned with Congress. And I'd like to make one, one additional point, if I may, on that uh, content that you've, you, you, you've exhibited, what to me is so interesting about that is it reflects the sophistication, in my view, of what we're dealing with. So this is not just an online attack. This is an online attack that affects multiple companies, multiple platforms, and it's also paired to offline activity. This is a national security issue, and it's one that we are taking very seriously. I know my colleagues here are taking very seriously, and we do need to work together to make sure we understand the scope of the threat, and we need to continue to work with law enforcement to make sure we're sharing information and expertise to really address this thoroughly. I appreciate your response to my questions, and I, I'm grateful uh, to Senators Graham and Whitehouse for today's hearing, uh, to Senator Klobuchar for her leadership in putting forward legislation to try and tackle this significant challenge. Uh, but gentlemen, I, I wish we had the executives of your three companies before us today, and I look forward to hearing in more concrete ways the steps your organizations are taking to address these very real threats to our democracy. Thank you. Uh, for the member's information, I think there are two votes. Uh, one just started, so we're just going to keep um, marching on here and just take turns voting. And Senator Cruz. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. I appreciate each of you coming and testifying today. You know, I recognize that a lot of folks in the media are, and even some members of this committee, are praising your companies for taking active steps to police some of the content on your sites. Uh, but I have to note that doing so raises troublesome concerns at the same time, uh, particularly given the percentage of news and political information that Americans receive online through social media or through other online avenues. The prospect of Silicon Valley companies actively censoring the speech or the news content is troubling to anyone who cares about a democratic process with a robust First Amendment. Take one example, uh, which is Google. In December of 2015, a professor at Northwestern University conducted a study analyzing Google search results. He searched for the names of all 16 presidential candidates at the time and discovered that Democrats on average had seven favorable search results among Google's top 10, and Republican candidates had 5.9 positive articles. And indeed, of the major candidates at the time, Hillary Clinton had five positive search results and only one negative on the first page. Donald Trump had four positive and three negative search results on the first page. Bernie Sanders had nine positive results without a single negative result on the first page. And a final candidate, the junior senator from Texas, had a total of zero positive results on the first page. You may well have been citing my colleague from Minnesota on that page. That is outrageous. I, I will note, I will say if there were a Franken filter, that might be popular. That same professor ran a second study and found the vast majority of news outlets that were represented in Google searches were left-leaning. It's not just Google. In 2016, it was revealed that Facebook was, quote, curating the list of trending news stories on their website. According to reports, Facebook workers were artificially spiking conservative stories, including stories about former IRS official Lois Lerner, former Navy SEAL Chris Kyle, and positive stories about conservative politicians. The reports also revealed that stories by conservative outlets like the Washington Examiner or Newsmax that were popular enough to be picked up by Facebook's trending stories algorithm were nonetheless excluded until the New York Times and CNN began covering the same stories. Just last month, Twitter barred Representative Marsha Blackburn from advertising her campaign launch video because it deemed a line about her efforts to investigate Planned Parenthood to be inflammatory. The Susan B. Anthony list recently had a video advertisement against a political candidate blocked on Twitter because it referred to partial birth abortion as being akin to infanticide. Now, that, those are all political positions that people can take in our democratic society. But it is disconcerting if those political positions become a lens through which the American consumers consume news. So I want to ask each of you, do you consider your sites, Mr. Edgett and Mr. Stretch, uh, to be neutral public fora? Senator, Senator, we th we think of Facebook as a platform for all ideas, and we we have boundaries in the sense that we don't permit certain categories of content, such as hate speech. But within those guidelines, we do not in any way discriminate on the basis of viewpoint or ideology. So I, I'm just trying to understand: is that a yes or no? Whether you consider yourself to be a, a, a neutral public forum? 
we don't use, we don't think of it in the terms of neutral because what we're trying to do actually is provide each user a personalized news feed that will be the content that's most interesting to that user. But we do think of ourselves as, again, within the boundaries that I described, open to all ideas without regard to viewpoint or ideology. Mr. Edget, same question. Uh, free expression and uh, free speech is at the core of, of the Twitter Twitter mission, and we do everything we can to enable that. Uh, obviously, balancing things like Mr. Stretch said against violence, uh, violent threats, or abuse and harassment. But we believe that allowing the public and open platform that the Twitter serves its community is one that's important to debate and discussion. And Mr. Chairman, if I can ask a final question, I'm at the end of my time. I, but I how, just, how do you respond? Chairman, Last I checked, I'm, I'm not going to object, but I would note that, Chairman, you and I are the only two who sat through all of this today. And I would like to have a chance to ask a question yeah, before you will, votes quick over. Question. But of course, I'll let Senator go Cruz ahead. go ahead. How do both of you respond to the public concerns and growing concerns that your respective company and other Silicon Valley companies are putting a thumb on the scale of political debate and shifting it in ways consistent with the political views uh, of your employees? Senator, again, we we think of ourselves as a platform of all idea, for all ideas, and we, and we aspire to that. We are acutely aware of the possibility of unconscious bias across a range of issues, uh, not just politics, and we train our employees on that for that precise reason. We want to make sure that people's own biases are not brought to bear in how we manage the platform. Similar at, Facebook, or at Twitter, we are spending a lot of time training these employees who are looking at user reports on organic tweets. Um, we have stricter policies around advertisements. The one you referenced is an example of that, where uh, since we are serving those ads to, to, to folks who aren't following the accounts and haven't asked to see the content, we want to make sure it's always a positive experience. But even there, we're making tough calls, and we're learning from, from mistakes and revising policies and procedures going forward. But, but our goal and our, one of our fundamental principles at the company is to remain impartial. Thank you. Chairman, um, as I said, you, you and I are the only two that sat through all, all of this. And I, I must admit, I'm, with all due respect to all of your companies, I hear a lot of Johnny come late late. Uh, there's a lot that I think you could have done earlier. I suspect that you're uh, advertising department has watched the, the profits go up, and I wish they'd spent some of those profits earlier at uh, looking at what the content was. And I do know that we have to be very careful not to be censors, but I'll start with you, Mr. Stretch. We know that an estimated 126 million people, as one other witness said, were exposed to misinformation posted by Russia's Internet Research Agency on Facebook. The vast majority of this was not associated with advertisement, this free Russian propaganda that has spread like wildfire. Now, let me show you. These, these strongly resemble pages you've already linked to Russia. The minimum these pages are inflammatory. When I mentioned Johnny come lately, these were on today, today. Uh, and it's a problem. Now, can you tell me the certainty that none of these pages were created by Russian-linked organizations? They're very similar uh, to some we've seen before. Senator, I can, I can tell you with absolute certainty that none of them are linked to the accounts that we identified as, as coordinated inauthentic activity. Uh, because we've removed all of that, all of those accounts from our site. Um, They're pretty similar to some of them. The core problem with the accounts we identified was a lack of authenticity. So 
it wasn't so much the content, although to be clear, much of that content is offensive and has no place on Facebook. But the real problem with what we saw was its lack of authenticity, the fact that it came from fake accounts masquerading as authentic individuals on Facebook. We would have to look at that content to understand if it suffered from the same, or the, the accounts associated with that content me, to understand if it was the same sort of activity. Then another thing, we have, um, in Virginia, we have a governor's race, one candidate's running on a pledge to protect Confederate statues. In Alabama, we have a Senate candidate who reportedly called being gay detestable, said that Muslims should not be allowed to serve in, in Congress. Now, these seem like the kind of things uh, that could be exploited, just as the Russians did with the 2016 presidential election. Uh, is there any indication the Russians are doing that now on these two races? Senator, we have not seen evidence of that uh, in connection with those two races. I will say that the- Are you looking for it? Absolutely. We are focused on addressing this behavior going forward, not just in connection in the, with those two races, but throughout uh, uh, the country and indeed around the world. Each time there's an election, we face a challenge and a responsibility to, to ensure that the platform is not used for abuse, and we're investing heavily to make sure we meet that challenge. Let me, let me, um, let me ask about that. Facebook's fastest growing markets are in the developing world. Now there, um, consequences of spreading fake or diverse, di divisive information can be dire, it's not just an election, it's people's lives. For example, Facebook is being used today as a breeding ground for hate speech against Rohingya refugees in Myanmar. Uh, these are especially vulnerable people. They're being violently persecuted. The leadership in that country is not doing a darn thing, uh, even though it includes a Nobel Peace Prize recipient, not doing a darn thing to, ha to stop this persecution. In Cambodia, the authoritarian government is exploiting social media to smear dissidents. What are, you, what are you doing? You're, you're monetizing, increasingly monetizing information from users in the developing world, and you have an absolute right to do that. But what are you doing to make sure it's not used to undermine nascent uh, democracies, especially in the undermining? It's not losing votes, it's losing lives. Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, it's really an excellent, excellent point and a, and a very, a very challenging topic. Uh, as anyone who has followed the news is aware, the tragedy that's unfolding in in Myanmar is 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 horrifying. We view our platform, in that sense, as a as a vehicle for providing greater visibility into what's going on around the world and greater visibility into human rights abuses. Now we do have an obligation to make sure that it is not misused. And the way- And we're talking about lives. I, Senator- Neymar is an example of that, Cambodia. Okay, why? Well, I, I, I don't disagree and, and, and we have teams uh, with, with language competence who are working with local organizations to understand the particular challenges associated with operating in those regions and to make sure we get it right. We do believe we have a role to play in raising visibility, but at the same time not be used uh, as a tool to, for example, foment hatred uh, or glorify violence in any way. Well, you can understand our concern. I mean, uh, uh, Russia's internet research agency set up a fake Twitter account to the Tennessee Republican Party. They sent out a stream of fake claims, including allegations of voter fraud. People knew it was, and yet it was retweeted by Kellyanne Conway, Donald Trump Jr., and even President Trump last month, even though everybody knew it was fake. This is what happens. Um, it is frustrating. I don't say that as a, as a Democrat. I say as an American. I said, as one who's visited countries around the world, trying to protect the right to vote, and then we see Russians coming here. 
So, speaking of voting, I will now go and vote. But please understand, you have admire what you've been able to do uh, in reaching people, but you have a great responsibility. Not only can elections be swayed this way by people who don't are not favorable to the, to the United States, but people can die. So thank you. Thank you. Blumenthal. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our chair people, uh, Chairman Graham and Chairman Whitehouse for holding this hearing. And thanks to each of you for being here today. We don't need to lecture you on your social responsibility. I'm convinced you are well aware of it. And I'm also convinced that you understand the perniciously malign effects of abuses such as we've shown you and you've provided to us. In fact, they are a cancer on our democracy and they will metastasize into distortions of our democratic process unless we throttle them by disclosure. In this realm, the cure for untruth is in fact more truth and disclosure. That's why I've joined the bill that's been offered by Senators Klobuchar and Warner, but also am crafting my own bill to provide for even broader disclosure, not limited to the political realm, because just as you said, the internet is borderless. It is also largely anonymous, and it is ill-defined in terms of subject matter. So I want to first uh, show you uh, something that I find maybe the most kind of reprehensible sign of uh, what can go wrong in this realm. And it is uh, from Twitter, provided to us. It shows, in effect, a deliberate misleading of people, you're aware of it, that they can vote, in effect, online. And my question to you is, using this celebrity's image, Aziz Ansari, who's well known to the group that's likely to believe it, prompted some people to think they voted, avoiding the line, save time, avoid line, when in fact their votes were completely negated. Do you know how many people voted, in quotes, in this way, thought they voted, but in fact were fooled? We aren't able to quantify that, but what we were able to see before we took down this and, and all other tweets like it as illegal voter suppression on our platform, and we've provided all of those tweets to, to the committee staff, is that there was a there's an outpouring of, of tweets refuting these, these, these tweets as, as being false and, and illegal voter suppression. We, we saw uh, eight times as many tweets seen on, on the, refu the refuting tweets. We saw 10 times as many users uh, retweeting tweets that, that, that warned other voters about But that. there's no question in your mind that this kind of image is voter suppression. By the way, I have 20, 30, 40 of them, so there may have been people discounting them, but at the same time, they kept reappearing. The, and you're telling us you have no way of noting how many voters, in effect, wasted their efforts believing this false image, correct? We were focused on removing the content right, as quickly you, as we You can't could. tell us. Can you do the research to tell us? I'm not sure we'll, we're, we're able to link. Can you commit that you will try? We will absolutely get your staff Thank you. all the information we can. There, there's an area that we haven't covered, and uh, if we still have Senator Coons's uh, image from the heart of Texas, uh, it's been taken away. it has been taken away, I'm told. So we can do without the image. Uh, let me ask you, Mr. Stretch, uh, that post or ad, whatever you call it, was in fact targeted to an audience, correct? 
So each of the posts was targeted to an audience. I, I, I confess I'm not sure precisely which one you're referring to. Uh, the one that um, had um, the image of, um, it's, it's this one, it had an image of a soldier and it referred to Hillary Clinton has a 69 percent disappro disapproval rate among veterans. Uh, you, you'll I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with it, yes, thank you. So this ad, among many others, was provided to our committee. I've been through, I think, a lot or most or perhaps all of the ads. And what struck me is not just the ads and how misleading they are, and you use the word sophisticated, absolutely right. These ads are sophisticated in their malignant distortion, but they're also targeted. In fact, uh, the information that you provided us indicates this ad was targeted at people in the state of Texas, 18 to 65 years old. It had various other characteristics, interests, independence, or patriotism. That's true of most of the ads that you provided us. They have indicia of targeting, which also was extremely sophisticated, correct? Certainly the interest-based targeting appeared to reflect an understanding of the type of audience these, these actors were trying to reach. There is a professional activity that helps target ads, correct? There, there, are, there are certainly many, many, many companies and individuals who, who work on targeting right. digital media, yes. Do you know who helped the Internet Research Agency in doing this targeting? Senator, we're, we're not able to essentially see behind the, the accounts. All we can see is the activity that's on our platform. So it could have been a political campaign that provided this information about targeting. As I say, we're, we're not able to see, see behind the accounts. All, all, we, all we essentially get is the targeting information which, which we've provided to the committee. Let me request that you endeavor as best you can with the research available to you to give us information about how the Internet Research Agency and any other Russian-sponsored activities were able to target these ads to specific groups, individuals, geographic areas, demographic, and age groups. Thank you. Senator Franken. Well, th thank you, Ranking Member f and the Chair for holding this. Uh, we've been looking at the uh, Russian attack on our democracy and been questioning government officials, past and present, and uh, campaign people for the Trump campaign. But now, uh, this is... Uh, we, the extent to which the Russians exploited your platforms is bringing the question in. You know, maybe this isn't something. This isn't something just the government has to do. This is something that you guys have to uh, have to deal with and and fix. Um, and you were kind of the canary in the coal mine in 2016, and at the same time. Uh, Russia was conducting cyber espionage against American political organizations. They deployed this propaganda program on your platforms, in some case paying for it in rubles. So I want to understand why no one seems to have caught, caught on to the Russian effort earlier. Mr. Stretch, how did Facebook, which prides itself on being able to process billions of data points, and instantly transform them into personal connections for its user, somehow not make the connection that electoral ads paid for in rubles were coming from Russia. Those are two data points. American political ads and Russian money, rubles. How could you not connect those two dots? Senator, you mentioned uh, one aspect of uh, the, the 
the Russian threat that was so visible in 2016, which was the, the question of account compromise stealing contents and um, disseminating them. And, and that's a threat our security team was intensely focused on and we think effectively addressed. I think in hindsight, we should have had a broader lens. There were signals we missed and we are now okay, focused. Okay, people are buying ads on your platform with rubles. They're political ads. You put billions of data points together all the time. That's what I hear that these platforms do. They're the most sophisticated things invented by man ever. All, Google has all knowledge that man has ever developed. <laughs> you can't put together rubles with a political ad and go like, hmm, those two data points spell out something bad. Senator, it's it's a signal we should have been uh, alert to, and and in hindsight, uh, it's one we missed. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, will Facebook commit not to accepting political ads paid for with foreign money in the future, say with rubles or the North Korean won? If if a political ad with a won is paid for by a won, a North Korean won. Will you pledge not to put it on? Senator, our, our goal is to require all political advertisers, regardless of currency, to uh, provide documentation and inf information demonstrating that they're authorized to advertise. The, the currency signal, I understand your point, it's a signal we should have, so we should have missed. You can't say no to that. The currency signal. You can't it, say no to that. It's very easy to Please answer yes or no, sir. I'm asking you a question. Just answer yes or no. Can you do that? You're sophisticated. You're the chief legal counsel for Facebook. Please answer yes or no. I can tell you that we're not going to permit advertising to uh, permit political advertising by foreign actors. The, the reason I'm hesitating on foreign currency is that it's relatively easy for bad actors to switch currency. So it's it's a signal, but it's not enough. We have well, to sweep more broadly. Why would anyone use the North Korean won? Why would a bad actor go like, I'm going to trick Facebook. I'm going to use the North Korean won. Senator, our, our goal is to make sure we're addressing all forms of abuse. Uh, my goal is for you to think through this stuff a little bit better. Can, can I have a little bit more time? Well, I, I, uh, Senator Hirono, you're next. Thank you. Since all of you commit to doing better, uh, do you have a do each of you have a, a, a mission statement uh, regarding your commitment to prevent the use of your platforms to promote, as Mr. Stretch describes it, to, uh, to prevent the uh, promotion of discord or, or fomenting of uh, discord? Is there a, some statement that you can tell us that, that says, okay, we're committed that this is not going to happen again? Mr. Stretch, we'll start with you. So. Our mission is to give people the power to build community uh, and bring the world closer together. Our policies prohibit hate speech of all kinds as well as other forms of bullying and harassment. Well, one thing that you said, Mr. Stretch, in response to uh, uh, one of the other questions was, you said authenticity is our responsibility. I kind of like that as a mission, mission statement for all three of your companies, authenticity. At, at Facebook, we do require people to use the service uh, by the name they're known by, and we believe that's a, a very important part of, of the service Facebook offers. Um, it is, to us, the cornerstone of authentic dialogue. We want to make sure people, when they come to Facebook, can trust the content they see, and it is our responsibility to make sure that we're enforcing that by policing bad actors who are using inauthentic accounts. Or a simple mission statement like, you can trust our platform. So do, uh, to Mr. Ejed or Mr. Salgado, do you have a mission statement with regard to this particular concern that we are addressing in the hearing today? 
Yeah, one of our underlying missions is to to help unite and inform. And obviously, the the, the type of activity we're talking about today is is intended to divide. Uh, so we we're working ve we're working very hard on this. Um, we have a policy around anonymity to allow free speech and expression, especially in in more difficult parts of the world, uh, to to enable uh, political dissidents or um, embedded journalists or human rights act activists to take on a, a different persona to, to speak truth to powerful individuals. Uh, so we're always trying to balance that with the, the ability to make sure that we're not, we're not trying to divide um, through political or state-sponsored acts like we're talking about today. Well, I'll let Mr. Salgado also respond briefly. Sure, briefly. Well, absolutely. And and we just uh, put out a public uh, statement, I think it was even yesterday, about uh, wanting to do better in this area uh, and being committed to do so and setting out some specific steps. Yes, we are in very interested in the specific steps. And Mr. Stretch, you, you said that there are 150 people at uh, Facebook just focused on the content of uh, the, the, the the content of what's what's on your platform. How many people do you have, Mr. Edget, at Twitter to concentrate on the content and ferreting out the kind of, of uh, uh, content that would be deemed unaccept unacceptable, divisive? I realize there are a lot of First Amendment complicated right. issues, but how many people do you have? Well, we, we harness the power of both uh, technology, algorithms, machine learning to, to help us. Uh, and also a, a large team of people that we call the tr our trust and safety team and our user services team. It's hundreds of people. We're at a different scale than Facebook and Google, obviously, uh, but we're, de we're dedicating a lot of resource to make sure that we're looking at user reports about activity on the platform that they think is violent or activity on the platform they think is illegal and prioritizing that accordingly. So you have fewer people than Facebook. Facebook has 150. You said you have hundreds. No, we have hundreds, uh, hundreds. Across, across user services and trust and safety, looking at the issues of content on the, on the platform. What about you? Uh, about Google has, has thousands of people. There's, there's many different products and, and different teams work on them, but uh, internally we'll have thousands of people working on them. We also uh, get a good deal of leads on uh, content that we need to review for whether it's appropriate or not that come from outside the company. You well. have thousands of people just focused on the content on as very Mr. Stretch content. indicated to us that he has at Facebook? You have thousands of people dedicated? We have thousands of people dedicated to make sure that content across our, remember Google is a, has many different properties within it, uh, but yes, the answer is we have thousands that look at content that has been reported to us as inappropriate. So in view of that, Mr. Stretch, do you think 150 people is enough people? Senator, to be clear, the, the 150 people I mentioned earlier is people whose full-time job is focused on addressing terrorism content on Facebook. In terms of addressing content on the site, generally, we have thousands. And indeed, we have a community operations team uh, that we announced earlier that we were this year that we were going to be adding additional thousands to the several thousands that are already working on this problem every day. I think, I think it's day. pretty clear that this is a whole new sort of a, a use or misuse of your platform and you may have various ways to address uh, terrorist content, but this is a whole other thing. I do have, um, hmm, may I ask one more question? This is, this is a short one for Mr. Stretch because uh, you uh, indicated that the, there were 126 million people who uh, saw uh, the content uh, associated with the Internet Research Agency and that may be just the tip of the iceberg because that was just from one source and there may be plenty of other dark sources out there. And in an election where a total of about 115,000 votes would have changed the outcome, can you say that the false and misleading propaganda people saw on your Facebook didn't have an impact on the election? Can you say that it didn't have an impact on the election? Senator, we're not well positioned to judge why any one person or an entire electorate voted as it did. Uh, the content that we've provided to the committee was a very small fraction, 0.004% of the content that was served in the United States over the period in question. The point I do want to emphasize is that any amount, however 
small a fraction of this sort of content has no place on Facebook, and it's why yeah, we're I, investing I, to address this going forward. I don't think anybody can say that this kind of content did not have some kind of effect on our election outcomes. Thank you. Chairman Graham authorized a uh, second round of three minutes. If you guys are good to continue, then I'll uh, turn to Senator Klobuchar for three minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I had a, a follow-up question actually about um, voter suppression efforts. And Mr. Edgett, uh, we appreciate the ads that we saw, and we'd like to see all of them, of course. Um, but uh, some of the ads has been discussed contained misinformation uh, telling voters that they could vote online, which of course uh, wasn't true. In fact, here's one of them, targeted, of course, uh, telling people uh, that they could just text Hillary um, to that number, and that's how they vote. And I mean, you, you have clearly stated uh, this would be wrong, in fact, illegal, right? That's right. We, we took these down as illegal voter suppression. Right, and points. I appreciate that you did that, and you said there were more people, you know, yeah. on the line that called them out, those kinds of things. But I just want people to understand what this is. Uh, efforts like this are actually criminal. They're illegal. I'm not talking about your company here. I'm talking about people that are running these kinds of ads. I was thinking back to New Hampshire uh, where um, some of their um, uh, people there had actually um, engage in activity where they shut down a line so people couldn't get people to the polls, right? It was voter suppression. Right. The people that did that, one of them went to jail. Three people got charged with crimes. And so my point here is that these kinds of ads, how serious this is, this is voter suppression. It is actually illegal to do this. It is criminal. And I say it so that people understand why we need to have another kind of law in place, which is to police this conduct um, so that we don't have these kinds of things going on that are so very serious. And that's why Senator McCain and Senator Warner and I uh, have come together. So thank you. Um, Mr. Salgado, I just have um, just a remaining minute here. Our intelligence agencies have reported that the Kremlin is spending nearly $200 million a year or that they had done that, spreading propaganda through outlets like RT. Uh, in the lead up to the election, President Putin of Russia sought to delegi delegitimize uh, the U.S. electoral system by intensifying critical coverage on RT. Uh, RT is one of the most popular channels on YouTube. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it, it is a popular channel on YouTube, yes. So YouTube provides a share of the advertising money that it makes on popular channels to the sponsors of those channels. And there's actually these Google calculators that can help estimate potential earnings based on page impressions. The more clicks, the more money is made. Um, is it safe to say here then uh, that they make a significant amount of money in shared ad, ad revenue from you? Is Google actually paying this Kremlin-owned Entity, RT. I think RT uh, is making money on ad revenues through their uh, YouTube channel. That's but my do you actually pay them? Is Google paying them? Um, I'm not. I'm not sh sure exactly how the money flow goes, but the but the uh, we would certainly be involved in the uh, in the remuneration to the YouTube channels. Okay. Well, that sounds like you're paying them. It, 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 it may be. I'm, the only reason I'm hedging is I don't know exactly the financial okay, flow. Okay, so we'll follow up in writing That's on that fine, one. That's fine, yes. Okay, thank you. A couple of uh, final, I hope, very quick questions. One uh, for Mr. Edgett. With respect to both the graphic that uh, Senator Klobuchar just showed you and the one that uh, Senator Coons, uh, or maybe it was Senator Blumenthal with Aziz Ansari on it. Right. You can at least tell us how many people obeyed the instruction and texted Hillary to 59925. You don't know what other behavior you in, they engaged in, but you would know that. And you would also know who tweeted Clinton Kane with the hashtag, hashtag presidential election on November 8th, 2016, between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., correct? We would know the uh, second one, but we wouldn't be able to tell whether someone picked up their phone and, and texted that, that number. Okay, so the second one you can get to us. Um, and. There's been a certain, there's been kind of a bit of an atmosphere here that in terms of small dollar numbers, it's not such a big deal because you have such big platforms. Um, Vice News talked with the owner of a Facebook page who uses Facebook ads to juice content. After spending $34,100, the man controlled pages with 1.8 million likes 
with that distribution base, he was able to push out content that could hit some pretty serious numbers. Quote, with a few advertising dollars, one April video received more than 27 million views and over 450,000 shares, spreading so pervasively into the conservative media universe that Donald Trump's official Facebook shared it two days later, end quote. Would you agree based on that that the percentage share of your revenues that a particular intrusion like this is is not particularly relevant in terms of the harm to the uh, public? Senator, we're trying to provide facts, the information we know about our investigation, and, and we leave it to, to you and, and your investigators with visibility to a number of different sources to draw the conclusions you will. I just urge you to stop making the argument that because it's a small number, we shouldn't be so concerned. I don't think that's a legitimate argument on any of your part. Senator, I, if I just, if I may, we're trying to provide facts. I do not want to suggest in any way that we don't think this is a big deal. We think this is a huge deal. Okay, terrific. So, last two questions. Botnets, really good things that are useful to you or really terrible things that are a menace? In this context? In this context, I would describe automated uh, fake account creation as a menace. I would have to agree. We, 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 yeah. Menace. Uh, shell corporations that prevent you from looking through them and seeing who the true beneficial owner is in this context, a help or a menace? Anything that prevents us from policing the authenticity of our, of our users is a, is a menace. I would agree. I agree with that. All right, I'm done. Thank you, Chairman. Very quickly, and we'll move to the second uh, I'm gonna go for round the here. To be back. Yeah, uh, can you put up? So, to make it clear, are any of you in the content business? Do you make your own content? Do you generate content? Mr. Stretch. The vast, vast, vast majority of the content you see on Facebook is user-generated content. Okay, what percentage of content on Facebook do you generate? A, a minuscule percentage. Less than 1%? Yes. What about you, Mr. Edgett? Do you, are you on the content business? We're not in the content business. Uh, we're not in the content business. Okay. Uh, this is a Mr. Smith. We'll talk about this in a minute. But this is a poster provided to the com committee by Mr. Smith. Uh, it's on the Islamic State's uh, Niger News Telegram Messenger channels in April 2017. I hope they're out of business now. It encourages Islamic State supporters to distribute official Islamic State propaganda on Facebook, Twitter, and Google. It translates to... These are your domains, O oh, supporters of the caliphate. So can you give me your, do you all agree it's bad for business if the American public perceives you as being able to have your platforms hijacked by terrorists to radicalize Americans? It's all bad for business, right? It's, it's beyond bad for business. Senator, there's no place for terrorism on Facebook. Okay. We would agree with that, and our technology takes down 95% of terrorist accounts, 75% uh, of them before their first tweet. Okay. Oh, I agree with that proposition. Okay, on May 22nd in Manchester, there's a suicide bombing where the man in question killed 22 people. Uh, there's an ISIS bomb-making instructional video on YouTube uh, to build an explosive device. You took it down, it came back up. How do you prevent that from happening? Uh, yeah, there, there are a few techniques to keep uh, YouTube videos that are uh, violative of policy uh, from coming back up. One is to, uh, uh, of course, take action on the account, but the more sophisticated way is to generate a, essentially a digital fingerprint of that video uh, and then block future attempts to upload it. There are sometimes ways to evade it, uh, but in general it works very well, and when it works, it works perfectly. Uh, the other is to make sure that we have fast um, flagging processes so that when it comes back up again, it somehow evades us. We're notified of it by others uh, or ourselves quickly and take it down again. In very short order, what have you learned today, Mr. Stretch? I've learned the seriousness of this committee and its uh, approach to this, to this topic. Mr. Edgett. 
I've learned we have a lot more work to do, and we're focused on doing that. Mr. Salgado. Uh, I think it's quite clear that this is a problem that's going to take uh, the work of all the companies, policymakers, law enforcement, and NGOs to solve. Thank you all very much. We're going to do two more second rounds, and we've got to move to the second panel. Senator Franken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Stretch, representing Facebook, would not commit to not accepting political ads paid uh, for with foreign money. I asked him a yes or no, he would not answer. So I'd like to ask the same question of you, Mr. Edget, and you, Mr. Salgado. Uh, will Twitter and Google commit today to stop running electoral ads on American political campaigns that are paid for by foreign actors? I don't believe we do. Uh, I'll have to get back to you. Um, and part of the the initiative around transparency on who's paying for an ad is to help educate as well as who's behind the advertisement. But I don't believe we take rubles. Okay. Uh, just yes or no, will you not take foreign political ads paid for with foreign money? Yes. Okay. I would, I would want to check to make sure it's a good signal. If it's a good signal, yes. If it's not a good signal, then it's not a good approach. But the Really? Uh, Intention of it is is consistent. That's right. Okay, you know foreign <laughs> companies actually can't legally do that. Right, they foreign can't. companies can. That's right. So the the trick and is to make sure that uh, it is a signal that gives us the right hit. It's a very good signal, uh, and so it may be the the right one to use. Okay. Yeah. Okay, foreigners can't you know, use money in our campaigns. You know that, right? It's illegal. So you want to know if it'd be a good signal whether to do something illegal or not? No, the question is whether it's a signal, uh, if it's a good enough signal on illegality. But it, it, the, the, but you're absolutely right. There's not going to be room okay, for I think it's a very that. plain question. Okay. Mr. Stretch, ProPublica recently reported that up until last month, Facebook allowed advertisers using the company's self-service uh, ad buying platform to target more than 2,000 people who express interest in the topic of, quote, Jew hater and other anti Semitic themes. Apparently, these categories were created by an algorithm, not a human being. And Facebook removed them from the ad pl platform, but only after reporters notified the company about it. Mr. Stretch, I understand that Facebook has since taken a number of steps to prevent targeting based on self reported interest, but I question how such categories could be generated uh, and allowed to persist without any human oversight. Is it possible that Facebook really didn't know that these categories existed until the media told you? Senator, these categories, which of course are deeply offensive uh, and alarming, were as your question suggested, algorithmically generated, and we don't actually have any reason to believe they were actually used, but the mere possibility that our system permitted them to be generated is unacceptable. Uh, and that's exactly why we not only removed them, but launched a comprehensive review to make sure we have adequate guardrails in the terms. So, so you don't know how many people saw those ads? We're not, we're not aware of evidence that they were used, but, but, the, but the point I'm trying to make, Senator, is- But you is, don't know that they weren't. We, have, we don't know for certain that they were never used. That's, that's certainly correct. What we want to do is learn from this and make sure that with respect to the, the interest categories that we permit advertisers to target against, uh, obviously are not so vile and not so offensive, and so, we're so putting in place I, safeguards to address I know I'm out of time, it. Mr. Chairman, but you don't know how much revenue you generated from ad campaigns targeting Jew haters. We're not aware of any revenue that was generated using that, that, that target. Yeah, but that's not, you don't know whether you did or not, and therefore you don't know, the answer to my question is I don't know. The answer to your question is, I'm not aware of any revenue that was generated. We have no reason to believe they were used, but I cannot say that without equivocation. Thank you. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gen General, let me, let me say once again, I'm very proud that, that you're here representing companies that are American companies. And, and I do believe you do enormous good. But I do find your power breathtaking. 
uh, I don't believe that uh, you have the ability to determine the identity of all your advertisers. You're good, but you're not that good. I don't believe you. And I, I don't, I'm not saying you're not telling the truth. I just don't think that you can because they change so quickly. Um, I also agree with Senator Durbin. We've got to be careful here. If we tell you, go forth and don't run any more advertisements that are divisive, well, that's going to require you to ed edit and censor content. And that kind of bothers me, too. Um, here's my question on an unrelated subject, though it is related, because none of this would be possible with, without, without your ability to target people. If I came to you, let's suppose I'm a, uh, a liquor advertiser, and I, let me start with Google, because I didn't mean to pick on Facebook the whole time. Um, and I came to Google and I said, look, can you put, I want to run some liquor ads. Can you put together for me a list of everybody who's, who's depressed? Could you do that? I don't think we would have the ability to do that or anything close to doing that. Okay. How about, could Facebook do that? Absolutely not. Okay. Could, could you, uh, put together, uh, could Facebook, could I come to Facebook and say, I sell diet pills. Can you put together for me a list of all teenagers who think they're overweight? No. You couldn't? No. Well, I'm, I'm looking at a report from the Australian in May of 2017 where it reported that Facebook put together a 23-page memo for an advertiser demonstrating how it could micro-target 6.4 million teenagers during moments of emotional vulnerability when they were stressed and anxious and insecure. Was that reporting wrong? That reporting relied on um, a internal document that was overstated and, and in the wake of that reporting we have put in place safeguards to prevent any sort of ad targeting but on that basis. I, I guess what I'm getting to, I'm not accusing you of anything. If I could just have 30 extra seconds, Mr. Chairman, I'm not accusing you of anything. I understand your internal rules and I respect those and I admire those. But you have the ability, you have the ability to give me a list of people are people who are using Facebook or Google who are teenagers who are insecure about their weight. Now, you may not sell that to an advertiser, but you have the ability, just like I believe you have the ability to go look specifically at Senator Graham's or me, my profile. Now, you may have a policy against that, but I believe you can do it. Can you not? Again, Senator, we have architected our systems so that I may not. But you could if you wanted to. Any user on Facebook will share information that's related to their own interests and their own activities, and it's it's why it it is precisely because that information is personal and the, and why. I understand, and I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, but I'm trying to just give a straight answer. I'm not asking you what's moral or immoral or or what your rules are. I'm saying if you wanted to, is it not the case that you can go to John Kennedy's profile and see things about John Kennedy as a result of my activity on Facebook? You have that ability, do you not? C certainly, Senator. Any user, including myself, could navigate to your profile and see what you've chosen to share do, on do, Facebook. Does, does Twitter have that ability? Yeah, j largely, our, our profiles are public, so all of the things that you've liked or retweeted okay. or tweeted. Does, fa does Google have that ability? If, if, you, went to, if you went to your accounts.google.com page, you would see what we have. That's not what I'm you. asking. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I'm yeah. just trying to give. I, I don't mean to be rude. I just want a straight answer, okay? If I'm the president of your company and I came to you and no disrespect but said, here's an order. If you don't do it, you're fired and I'm taking all your stock options, okay? I want you to go 
find Senator Graham's account and tell me everything you know about him. I'm not saying you would do it, not do it. I'm not getting into ethics. I'm not saying, talking about your internal rules. I'm saying you have the ability do, to do that, don't you? We certainly have the ability to, to look at a user's account. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you to the panel, and we'll have the second panel. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you both for coming. Uh, could you please uh, raise your right hand? We solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, old truth, nothing but truth, so have you got it. Uh, the second panel uh, consists of Mr. Clint Watts, who's a Robert A. Fox Fellow, Foreign Policy Research Institute, who's been uh, dealing with uh, child pornography and terrorism issues on the internet for a very long time. Mr. Michaels. Smith, uh, the second, is a terrorism analyst who's dedicated a lot of his adult life to dealing with uh, jihadist uh, efforts to radicalize on the Internet and other issues. Mr. Watts, could you please lead us off? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee uh, for having me here today. A decade ago, al-Qaeda in Iraq littered YouTube with violent videos, and a few years later, Twitter became a platform for al-Shabaab and its violent tirades in Somalia. During the same period, I watched as thousands of men and women joined up with ISIS through Facebook, Twitter, Telegram, and later paved the way for the Islamic State and terrorist violence around the world. During that social media research, I encountered Russian influence efforts. In the nearly four years since, I've watched as they've employed social media at a master level to perpetrate the largest and most successful information attack in world history, a campaign that cont continues to harm our country even today. Each social media company has uncovered some piece of Russia's so social media campaign, but no one company alone can fully comprehend the extent of Krem Kremlin operations. As they conduct investigations in their data, they'll, reach, they'll each detect only those accounts where the Kremlin failed to hide its hand, seeing only the tip of the iceberg floating above the social media sea upon which they float. Each platform serves a function, a role in an interlocking social media ecosystem where Russia pursues five complementary social media functions to achieve, achieve its ob objectives. They'll do reconnaissance on platforms like Facebook and LinkedIn where you can see organizational personal preferences and how communities operate. They'll host on YouTube, both overtly and covertly, to hide their hand. They'll do placements on anonymous websites or social media platforms like 4chan and Reddit, They'll propagate their messages through Twitter, and they'll saturate their audiences on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, or any other platform where there are American Z. Russia employs all social media in concert to achieve its influence. As a hypothetical example, an anonymous forgery placed on 4chan can be discussed by Kremlin Twitter accounts, who can then amplify those discussions with social bots. A Russian state-sponsored outlet on YouTube can report on that Twitter discussion. The YouTube news story is then pushed into Facebook communities, amplified through ads, or promoted against bogus groups. Each social media company will see a part, but unless all the social, companies, social media companies share their data, no one can fully comprehend the scope of Russia's manipulation and the degree of their impact. Russia is the first to successfully integrate the entire social media spectrum, but they won't be the last. The Kremlin playbook will be adopted by authoritarians, dark political campaigns, Unregulated global corporations will use this type of social media manipulation to influence weaker countries, harm less educated vulnerable populations, and mire business challengers. Social companies must move to deal with Russian disinformation, but also look beyond the much larger and more ominous problem of misinformation. Some analysts have concluded that fake news outperformed mainstream news in the lead up to the election. The recent tragedy in Las Vegas saw an innocent man falsely labeled a gunman on social media 
where bogus stories quickly trended to the top of Facebook and Google searches. More startling just the past few weeks has been the ethnic divisions, divisions and resulting violence in Myanmar stemming from misinformation disseminated on Facebook. I'd offer some additional recommendations in addition to my previous testimony to the Senate Intel and Armed, Armed Services Committees. Federal laws governing attribution of political ads and solicitations in television, radio, and print should immediately be extended to social media advertising conducted by all political campaigns and action groups. Account anonymity in public provides some benefits to society, but social media companies must work to immediately confirm real humans operate accounts. The negative effects of social bots far outweigh any benefits that come from the anonymous replication of accounts that broadcast high volumes of misinformation. Reasonable limits on the number of posts any account can make during an hour, day, or week should be developed, and human verification systems should be employed by all social media companies to reduce automated broadcasting. Social co media companies continue to get beat in part because they rely too heavy on technologists and technical detection to catch bad actors. In summary, the art of social media influence drives the science. Figure out what bad actors will do on these platforms and it's much easier to detect them. Threat, intelligent, proactively, threat intelligence proactively anticipating how bad actors will use social media platforms needs to be advanced to help technical detection improve. Lastly, I admire those social media companies that have begun working to fact check news articles in the wake of last year's elections. These efforts should continue, but will be completely inadequate. Stopping false information, the artillery barrage landing on social media users comes only when those outlets distributing bogus stories are silenced. Silence the guns and the barrage will end. I propose the equivalent of nutrition labels for information outlets, a rating icon for news producing outlets displayed next to their news links and social media feeds and search engines. The icon provides users an assessment of the news outlet's ratio of fact versus fiction and opinion versus reporting. The rating system would be opt-in. It would not infringe on freedom of speech or freedom of the press, should not be part of the U.S. government, should sit separate from the social media companies but be utilized by them. Users wanting to consume information from outlets with a poor rating wouldn't be prohibited, and if they are misled about the truth, they have only themselves to blame. It's been more than a year since my colleagues and I described how the Russian disinformation system attacked our American de democracy. We've all learned considerably more since then about the Kremlin's campaigns, w witnessed their move to France and Germany, and now watch as the world's worst regimes duplicate their methods. Yet our country remains stalled in observation halted by deliberation, and with each day more divided by manipulative forces coming from afar. The U.S. government, social media companies, and democracies around the world don't have any more time to wait. In conclusion, civil wars don't start with gunshots, they start with words. America's war with itself has already begun. Russian influence is rife. We all must act now on the social media battlefield to quell information rebellions that can quickly lead to violence and make the United States of America the divided States of America. Thank you. Chairman Graham, Ranking Member Whitehouse, distinguished subcommittee members and staff, I am honored by the opportunity to participate in this hearing concerning one of the most pressing challenges for America's national security, the global influence operations being waged in the cyber domain by foreign terrorist organizations whose members have converted American companies' popular social media and file sharing sites into tools used to incite violence against Americans and our closest allies. The bottom line up front, the environment terrorists have found it so easy to operate in online is one which American companies could have reshaped years ago when the American-born Al-Qaeda cleric Anwar al-Awlaki used tools like Facebook and YouTube to expand Al-Qaeda's reach into our homeland. Meanwhile, petitioning for attacks like the one that occurred at Fort Hood in 2009. In more recent years, the surge of attacks executed in the West by Islamic State supporters not trained in its primary areas of operation indicates Islamic State has achieved a power of persuasion sufficient to remotely accelerate the radicalization process culminating in a resort to violence. During this time, American companies whose technologies have been used by Islamic State and other terrorist groups to expand their capabilities to recruit and incite violence have yet to develop countermeasures which effectively deter terrorists from continually exploiting their technologies. That situation very likely influenced Russian intelligence officials' calculations when assessing the feasibility of plans to harness these companies' technologies to undertake their influence operation targeting American voters. In mid-2014, Islamic State began converting popular social media and file sharing sites into tools used to wage the most aggressive and effective global influence operation of any terrorist group in history. 
With unprecedented efficacy, Islamic State propaganda broadcast globally using tools like YouTube and Google Drive has helped engineer perceptions of the group which enable it to persuade supporters to execute attacks here in the West. Social media platforms like the one managed by Twitter have been used by Islamic State to not only grow the audience for this propaganda, but to also identify prospective recruits. Islamic State has meanwhile used Twitter to promote hit lists containing targets for attacks in the United States and to crowdsource threat campaigns against journalists and terrorism analysts, myself included among them. Islamic State members have also used Twitter to advertise their contact credentials on encrypted and difficult to monitor chat applications like Telegram Messenger. In 2014, the emergence of large pro-Islamic State networks on social media platforms like the one managed by Twitter highlighted persistent deficiencies in strategic analysis against terrorist elements on the parts of American social media companies. Since then, increasingly aggressive account suspension and content removal initiatives undertaken by companies like Twitter, Facebook, and Alphabet have failed to dissuade Islamic State members from exploiting their technologies to encourage support for the group. The same can be said for Al-Qaeda. Other alarming deficiencies are events by Alphabet's policies. Notably, Alphabet has allowed YouTube and Google Drive users to promote videos featuring guidance provided by Salafi jihadist clerics like al alaki Killed earlier this year, senior Islamic State official Turki al-Bin Ali is another cleric whose guidance can easily be found on YouTube. These videos help generate buy-in for Salafi jihadia. This ideology informs the agendas of Al-Qaeda and Islamic State and other groups comprising the global jihad movement. This ideology imbues adherents with a sense of urgency to defend their faith vis-a-vis -vis support for terrorism campaigns waged against Americans and our allies. In addition to global broadcasting capabilities and worldwide connectivity with supporters, other factors make these companies' technologies attractive tools for terrorists. Notably, most of these companies allow account managers whose identities are unknown to them to simultaneously use various technologies, such as virtual private networks or VPNs, to mask their physical locations when active on these popular websites. This translates to an absence of risks encountered by Islamic State propagandists, recruiters, and supporters sufficient to deter them from continually exploiting these companies' technologies. Because if they are using the right VPNs, as Islamic State has encouraged its supporters to do for several years, it can be impossible for authorities to identify their physical locations once suspicious or illegal activity has been observed. Certainly, the same applies to a wide range of other illicit actors who are active on these platforms. Ultimately, American companies are not doing all they possibly can to mitigate threats emanating from popular spaces of the internet managed by them. Thank you again for this opportunity. I look forward to further discussing the set of problems with you. And if I may, that poster that you shared earlier, uh, the Nashir News Telegram channels, there are several hundred concurrently running at this time right now. And I think that the committee, the subcommittee members would be interested in knowing that there has been an explosion of chatter during this hearing, which suggests there may be a link to Islamic State and recent events that just unfolded during this hearing in New York. Okay, well, let's, uh, uh, you heard uh, Mr. Smith, some of the companies talk about they have a workforce dedicated to trying to understand content that may, uh, to the casual observer, not be jihadist in nature. Did you hear that testimony? I heard a portion of it, yes, sir, if, if you want to ask a yeah. question accordingly. So what, what, what's your view? Are they doing enough? To, have they figured this out? I don't have a strong grasp of what it is that they're attempting to do. I know that uh, several of these companies have hired various academics who have held positions at uh, pseudo-government think tanks, such as the uh, uh, Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, and are well known for the books they have written about Islamic State. But I think until recently, the people who were supposed to be experts on countering violent extremism at a company like Alphabet, for instance, whose experts I've had some interactions with, probably had at best a uh, junior level subject matter experts knowledge of the ideology which informs the agendas of these groups. So tell me what you, you think may have happened today. You were saying something about jihadist websites. Well, during this hearing, uh, there have been several uh, incidents that have unfolded uh, according to various news reports, which uh, resulted in several deaths in New York. And what we're seeing right now is an explosion of so-called chatter on key Islamic State-linked telegram channels, which are increasingly indicating there may be a link to the group in this event. In the very least, when they promote information about these types of incidents, what it serves to accomplish uh, is to remind so-called fence sitters, in other words, the people here in the West who have yet to either immigrate into the caliphate or execute attacks at home, helps to remind them of how easy it is to go out and do the things that the group's leadership has prescribed, specifically executing very simple attacks. Has anybody taken credit for it that you know of? Not yet, not yet, but it, it's, it's very early in the game, sure. Okay. Um, 
If you could give a grade to the three companies in terms of dealing with the terrorist threat on their platforms from ADF. Senator, I'd, I'd prefer to offer you a written response to that, but in sure. general, I, I think that the, they're all demonstrably concerned about the issue for a variety of reasons. Uh, however, the current legal framework really doesn't compel them to do a whole lot about all of this. So you think we need laws to not only compel them, but help them? Well, I think that social media and file sharing industries have become incredibly integrated with our society, and I, I think it's difficult to fathom industries which are so integrated with our society, such as the automotive industry or the airlines industry, uh, not having some form of stronger legislative oversight provided of those industries and the various policies which govern how they operate. Yeah, compared to what we do with the TV station, this is almost nothing, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, the Federal Communications Commission right now could step in and, you know, uh, petition that according to national security interests, uh, these groups should do things like require only verified account managers. In other words, managers of accounts whose identities are known to them, uh, that those are the only people who can use things like virtual private networks and other specialized browsers to mask their physical locations when online, because right now what you have is a situation where um, a, a person can basically go onto these, these uh, platforms and it would be like walking into a theater and screaming fire and watching people trample all over themselves and concomitantly being a ghost. Nobody has a way of attributing the activity. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Mr. Watts, uh, what's your take of what the, the, the tech companies are doing? How would you grade them if you could? Uh, I would say all have improved in recent years. Facebook is the best based on my experience. Uh, Google is not far behind. Twitter would be last and always resist. Uh, I think all new platforms, especially with encryption, Telegram, uh, some of the dark social media coming up will soon become platforms for bad actors and they'll struggle. Uh, each of these social media platforms is not built for security, uh, much like cybersecurity, you know, it comes later. And so bad actors find out where the, what the attributes are, the vulnerabilities of these platforms, and then they move to them. Even though they don't produce content like the local news, they're very much in the news business. Do you agree with that? Yeah, whether they realize it or not, they become the leading uh, disseminator of news around the world. And we have all kind of laws and regulations about how to run a TV station or radio station and how to interact on those networks. Is that correct? Yes. And we have virtually nothing in the area of social media as far as legal infrastructure. That's correct. That's why the Russians or anybody that wants to do influence goes to that platform. There's there are actually no laws restricting them from doing it, and it's a wide open playing field. Senator Whitehouse. Thanks again, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Watts, you've been a U.S. Army inf Infantry Officer. You've been an FBI Special Agent on the Joint Terrorism Task Force. You've been the Executive Officer of the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, and you've been a consultant to the FBI's Counterterrorism Division and National Security Branch, so you clearly take American national security very seriously. It is and has been your life's work. So when you say the Kremlin disinformation playbook, which we're talking about here, will also be adopted by authoritarians, dark political campaigns, and unregulated global corporations who will use this type of social media manipulation to influence weaker countries harm less educated vulnerable populations and mire business challengers, you're not just talking about the Russian election manipulation operation getting worse and having to be contained. You're talking about it as if it's a technology that other bad actors can adopt and have it metastasize entirely into new fields of um, dissimulation, propaganda, and so forth. Is yes, correct? Uh, everybody will duplicate this if they don't believe in the rule of law, if they want to destroy democracies from the inside out. Uh, anyone with enough resources and time and effort, uh, if they put it against this, they can, they can duplicate this. I could do, duplicate it if I chose to. So if we don't stop it now, it's going to get exponentially worse. Yes, and, and I think uh, the one thing that we should recognize is even in the U.S. political context, it, if we don't put some sort of regulation around it, if, if if, if bodies like this don't decide how we want American politics to work, everybody will be incentivized to use this same system against their political opponents, and, and if you don't, you will lose. I asked the uh, last panel to offer an opinion on how helpful they thought botnets were on the general uh, spectrum of being a really wonderful thing and a great help to mankind versus a uh, menace. 
in the context of this particular threat, how do botnets fall on that spectrum in your view? I, I can't imagine in any way how botnet, uh, social bots amplifying information uh, are more benefit than harm. Uh, it, it, it empowers the weak, it empowers those with technological advantages. Uh, you can spread a message, true or false, uh, worldwide. Um, it is a great tool. The computational propaganda is powerful for, for two separate reasons. One, it can create accounts that look like you and talk like you, which makes you more likely to believe it. The other thing is it can replicate a message so many times, the more times you see it, the more likely you are to believe it. So sounds it can actually like, create false worlds in the, in the social media space. Sounds like both of those characteristics are fraud characteristics. Yeah, it Not could showing be. up who you are and pretending that you're bigger or more than you are. Yeah, you could employ the same system even for spear phishing campaigns, you know, in the financial space to hack yeah. into accounts. You can put out, you know, false information or, or spear phishing in a very dramatic way for any cause. How about shell corporations? Are they a hindrance to trying to penetrate these disinformation campaigns and figure out who's really involved? Yes. I, I mean, I'm actually surprised that the Russians made the mistake of buying ads directly through the Internet Research Agency. I, I would have thought they would use a cutout or rented more. Uh, I would have used some sort of intermediary. That's a more sophisticated intelligence approach and one the Kremlin made a mistake on this time. By the way, crazy eventuality. In the time that we've been having this hearing, I made a comical reference to an imaginary entity called Americans for Puppies and Prosperity. In the time that we've had this hearing since I mentioned that, there is now an Americans for Puppies and Prosperity up with a picture of a puppy and it's being tweeted out. So congratulations. I was recently Who in knew? Finland, you know, working, I presented to the Europeans for the new hybrid center to fight this kind of, and before we had even left, there was a false account posing as the hybrid center they launched in Europe. So let me jump into the problem of the dark web, particularly when you're dealing with recruitment for jihadi violence. Very often the initial touch is made through traditional social media, Twitter, Facebook, whomever, and then as soon as they think they've got a likely prospect, they move to a dark website where law enforcement can't follow them and where the people who are at that table before you can't track them. Right. Question for the record, because I don't think we have the time to go through all that now, but could you give some advice on what either your predecessors in those chairs uh, or we in Congress should be doing about that social media dark web link where so much of the uh, evil transpires? Right. Uh, you radicalize in the open and you recruit in the dark, yes. and that's sort of how the system works. So the more you can clamp down on the open space, uh, the better you're going to be. There's less people that come in contact, and it is a staircase that gets you to there. Last uh, question. If X is the total amount of Russian election propaganda interference activity taking place in America, how much of that X do you think your predecessors in those chairs are aware of and addressing? O only Almost a, all, a tiny proportion? No, a fraction of it. Uh, we monitored networks in the lead up to the election going back 2015, 2016. One network which promoted the Interlick campaign that we saw in July 2016, we wrote about the Daily Beast, uh, half of it's still there today. So a, a tiny fraction is all the Tiny program. fraction. I, I would put at most, uh, it depends on the platform. Some yep. are better than others. I would say Facebook's probably removed the most. Twitter the least. I would bet Twitter is less than a quarter. And remember that this didn't end on election day. They're repopulating these social media platforms uh, ad nauseum, and they're trying to influence and, and infiltrate every U.S. audience space, by the way. The Russians see it on both sides, left, right, you know, whatever it might be. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if the two remaining senators could share five minutes, I'd appreciate it, because we had a pretty hard stop here. Uh, Senator Kennedy. I, I want to thank Senator Graham and Senator Whitehouse for holding this hearing, and I want to thank you for being here. I'll try to do it quick, quickly. Do you believe that Facebook, Twitter, uh, and Google have, have the ability right now to identify with accuracy who their advertisers are? Not who they say they are, but who they are. No. Do you? I believe they could create policies to enable them to accomplish that set of objectives. Certainly, right now, the indication is that they do not have policies in place that 
enable them to understand exactly who is advertising on their platforms. Okay. Um, the, the First Amendment implications of all of this concern me as well. I mean, what's fake news? What do you think fake news is? Uh, fake news uh, over the years since I, I've been involved in, in talking about this is any news the other side doesn't like. doesn't matter what side it is. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Senator, if I may, I'm teaching undergrads a course at Georgia State University this semester titled uh, Media, Culture, and Society, and we're about to start uh, classes focused on fake news uh, later this week. Uh, I would submit that fake news might best be defined as uh, deliberate mis- or disinformation, which is uh, tailored or engineered to achieve a, a particular outcome in the way of behaviors, to persuade uh, perceptions in a manner that uh, lead to behaviors such as perhaps a vote for or against somebody. Well, that's uh, a good definition, but I, I'll end on this. In whose opinion? But there, I think there are parameters that we could come around. I mean, reporting versus opinion is, is a key point of it. Uh, I think also in terms of fact versus fiction, I, I've actually set up rating systems on foreign media outlets before the U.S. government's paid me to do that, uh, you know, in the Iraq-Afghanistan campaigns. So there are systems to do that. We've done it for military commanders overseas. We, we could actually set up a system. doesn't mean everybody will agree on it, but it, it is a... Let me ask you one last quick one. Um, do you think it's a good idea to ask people who who uh, post political uh, advertisements on these platforms to say who paid for them? Yes. Yes. Senator I'm done. Sure. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. That's a great segue, Senator Kennedy. Thank you. I thought you. you'd like that. Uh, thank you. Um, and we hope you'll look at the bill. Um, um, we were really, it was important for us that it be bipartisan um, because I think it was um, Senator Rubio who once said, you know, one election, it affects one candidate in one party, and the next time it's going to affect the other one. Um, and I think we all have to remember this, and um, I've appreciated your questions along those lines, Senator Kennedy. Um, so, Mr. Watts, can you elaborate on how you. social media platforms have enabled Russian actors to maximize their attempts to influence our decisions? And, for instance, why can't they do that on TV? Um, right. Because, really, the TV has big reach, too, and so does radio. Um, and to explain to people out there um, why it's different. Uh, we know they're both paid ads, but how come they can get by with this on one media, with one media company's network and not the others? Uh, social media allows anyone to be micro-targeted. I, I can micro-target you or someone overseas just based on the volume of information that's available there. It's openly available. The other part is they very much understand um, preferences and particularly social issues. So if you look at the active measures playbook, they focus on four areas. One is political issues, two is social issues, three is financial, and the fourth is calamity or how people are, are incite fear in them. They use that, they watch it, and they try everything. So what you see from the ads going back to 2015 and the audiences the, they infiltrate, they were trying every divisive issue in America to see which one stuck. And once they figured that out, they then doubled down in that space. The last part is they can make themselves look like organic Americans. If they came through and said, I, I am the Kremlin. And I'm a Russian agent. You, right. I, I want you to believe ad. this uh, story about a, a Black Lives Matter protest or a Bundy Ranch standoff. You, you wouldn't take it. But as long as it looks like it comes from somebody that looks like you and talks like you, you're more likely to trust it, and that's why they're so effective. And so uh, this bill, we have the Honest Ad Bill. Um, it focuses on the political advertising. We know, as we've said many times, it doesn't solve everything. Uh, it does have a uh, provision in there that they should take reasonable efforts to uh, not have foreign influence, which I think will be helpful um, with some of the questions that have been raised here. But overall, do you see that as helpful uh, to get the disclosures and the disclaimers, and do you think it would be a good idea to pass our bill? Uh, yes, for sure. It's called a softball question. Yes, order. and th they will have some implementation problems, but yes, it's a good bill. Yeah, but I just keep harping on the fact that um, radio, little radio stations, the Duluth TV station, they get these issue ads, right? Right. And they have to decide to put them either online so people can see them or in a file. I know they're smaller, but they get a lot of ads too, and they're somehow able to figure this out. So what this would mean is they're simply going to have to start looking at themselves with all these new people they're hiring um, as having that kind of 
safeguards so that they are also looking at the ads. Someone is with some kind of rhythm in place because they're actually buying the ads that we're talking about. Right. They're not just putting up the cat videos. That's okay. right. So, um, um, Mr. Smith, the um, uh, this little change in topic, uh, we've seen uh, an alarming number of people traveling overseas to engage in extremist violence um, over the last few years, maybe a little bit decreased lately, but in Minnesota we had a number of recruiting cases that were prosecuted by uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office and uh, with some good results. Um, and um, can you elaborate on that? And I personally have seen um, the um, social media and some of the stuff, the FBI showed it to me in Minnesota. You know, they literally have them targeted showing an air ticket from, this is Al Shabaab, uh, Mogadishu, Minnesota to Mogadishu. They've actually done that. They have targeted ads to my state. Um, so could you talk about that and what could be done to police that? Uh, well, again, I, I think that oftentimes, um, well, r let me step back and say that right now what you see with Islamic State is uh, a, a far greater tolerance for risk in the employ of all these technologies to engage with people here in the West, particularly in the United States. Now, again, they're also simultaneously utilizing tools like virtual private networks so that it can be very difficult to pinpoint where they're located when they're attempting to initiate these relationship building uh, engagements on social media. Um, with respect to uh, the scenario that you've described there, uh, I think that ultimately it boils down to if it's a literal advertisement, I've not seen a literal advertisement in the case of Al-Shabaab literally paying Twitter to advertise to target those people, but as uh, Mr. Watts was pointing out, uh, the open source nature of these platforms makes it very easy for even uh, a, a person with limited technological savvy to target engagement. All they have to do is go to the search function, figure out what people are posting about, and they can generally start to watch those people's accounts and identify what their affinities are. are is this somebody who's potentially sympathetic to mm -hmm. Islamic State or Al-Qaeda? Um, now, meanwhile, of course, you know, in your state, uh, and it bears mention, of course, that one of the seven attacks in the United States explicitly claimed by Islamic State occurred about a year ago in your state. We still, I don't know if they, yeah, I mean, that guy, yes, we still, they're uh, looking at the evidence, I yes. know, about whether or not they actually did order that attack. But I'm yeah. sorry, we'll have to wrap this up oh, if you want to okay. finish your thought. Yes, uh, Senator, I, I believe that one thing that can be done to help mitigate that reach is um, for a company like Twitter, let's say mm -hmm. if that was the case, that, that Twitter was being used to engage with that audience in Minnesota, uh, to perhaps do a better job of searching certain terms that are very well known to right. be associated with somebody okay. who is expressing yep. affinity for these groups. Very good, and I'll ask the rest of the questions on the record. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, final thought. Uh, is it fair to say that um, foreign governments uh, manipulating social media platforms, terrorists using these platforms to recruit people to their cause is a national security problem uh, growing in nature? Yes, there's no boundaries in social media. So it allows the, the weakest yes, players to have fine. the strongest effect. Okay. Yes. Do you agree that we're woefully unprepared to deal with these two problems right now? No. You think we're, we think we are prepared? I believe that we could do an exponential amount to mitigate much. I'm about right now. I, I believe that that could be accomplished in very short order. Okay, but I'm not talking about short order, I'm talking about today. We have the capability, it's not being employed. Okay. We are in no way prepared right now for what's okay. going on. To those who uh, were injured and lost their lives in New York, we're all thinking about you. Thank you very much. The. Uh, We'll have open for one week. Anybody would like to submit anything for the record? The hearing's adjourned. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you.